Here are helpful nursing practice questions that may help you. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this. The client is brought to the emergency department after falling off a roof and landing on his back. AT1 spinal fracture is diagnosed. The client's blood pressure is 74 fortieths of a millimeter Hg, pulse is 50 per minute, and skin is pink and dry. What nursing action is a priority? 1. Administer IV normal saline. 2. Determine if urinary occult blood is present. 3. Perform a neurological assessment. 4. Verify that there is no stool impaction. Correct answer. Explanation. This presentation is classic for neurogenic shock, a distributive shock. Vascular dilation with decreased venous return to the heart is present due to loss of innervation from the spine. Classic signs, symptoms are hypotension, bradycardia, and pink and dry skin from the vasodilation. Neurogenic shock usually occurs in cervical or high thoracic injuries, T6 or higher. Systolic blood pressure should remain at 80 millimeters Hg or above to adequately perfuse the kidneys. Administration of fluids is a priority to ensure adequate kidney and other organ perfusion. Option 2. Testing for the presence of blood in the urine is important in determining if kidney damage has occurred, but circulation stability is a priority. Option 3. A neurological assessment is essential, but circulation stability is a priority. C before D, disability. Option 4, bladder and stool impaction are etiologies for autonomic dysreflexia and generally occur in a client with a high-level fracture at T6 or above with a stimulation below the fracture. Autonomic dysreflexia is a medical emergency that presents with severe headache, hypertension, piloerection, and diaphoresis. It is seen weeks to years after the injury. Educational objective. Neurogenic shock, distributive shock can occur from vasodilation soon after spinal injury. Classic symptoms are hypotension, bradycardia, and pink and dry skin. The hypotension must be treated with isotonic fluids to maintain vital organ perfusion. An emergency department nurse is sent to the scene of a massive motor vehicle collision. A client there reports neck pain. Which actions should the nurse perform at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Apply a hard cervical collar. 2. Assess neck range of motion. 3. Inspect client's respiratory pattern. 4. Position client flat on firm surface. 5. Use log rolling technique if moving client. Correct answer. The initial priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are to ensure a patent airway and immobilize the spine to prevent further injury. This includes applying a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, e.g., a backboard, and moving the client as a unit, log rolling, if required, options 1, 4, and 5. A soft foam cervical collar does not provide immobilization. Further stabilization is achieved by taping down the client's head and using straps to immobilize the arms, especially if the client is not cooperating. After immobilizing the client, the nurse should obtain a baseline set of vital signs to monitor for neurogenic shock, e.g., hypotension, bradycardia, poikilothermia, i.e., inability to regulate body temperature, a potential complication of spinal cord injury. The nurse should also assess the client's respiratory rate, pattern, and effort. Presence of abdominal breathing or increased work of breathing may indicate impending loss of airway and require prompt rapid sequence intubation, option 3. Option 2, movement of the neck, upper extremities should be avoided until cervical spine injury is ruled out with imaging, which is done after the spine is immobilized with a hard collar. Educational Objective the priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are maintaining a patent airway and spinal immobilization. Interventions include application of a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, log rolling the client during movement and transfers, and continued assessment of need for an advanced airway.
which would be the appropriate client criteria for activating a rapid response team at the hospital. Select all that apply. DCS, score of 9 throughout shift. 2. Heart rate remaining at 58 beats per minute for more than 1 hour. 3. Postoperative pain rated at 10. 4. Respiratory rate maintaining an increase to 30 breaths per minute. 5. Sustained change in level of consciousness for 10 minutes. Correct answer. The rapid response team is activated to marshal additional experienced and specialized resources for an acute need to try to prevent a client from deterioration into a code, arrest situation. The team has critical care expertise to provide immediate attention to unstable clients in non-critical care units and usually consists of a respiratory therapist, a critical care nurse, and a physician or advanced practice registered nurse. Recommended criteria to consider according to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement include the following. An acute change in any of the following. Heart rate less than 40 or greater than 130 per minute. Systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm Hg. Respiratory rate less than 8 or greater than 28 per minute. Option 4. Oxygen saturation less than 90 despite oxygen. Urine output less than 50 ml, 4 hour. Level of consciousness, option 5. Option 1, the GCS is abnormal but is stable in the abnormality. A rapid response would be used for a significant deteriorating trend. Option 2, many clients routinely run a slowed pulse rate, athletes. There is no indication that this is a new change for the client. It would be concerning if there was an effect on perfusion accompanied by chest pain, or if the heart rate was less than 40 per minute. Option 3, unrelieved pain is concerning, but the nurse can handle this through assessing the etiology, calling the healthcare provider, or adjusting the analgesia. Pain in and of itself is not an indication of client instability. Educational Objective Rapid response criteria for unstable clients in a non-acute care setting usually include sudden, significant changes that do not respond to treatment. When caring for a client with a left radial artery catheter, which assessment data obtained by the nurse indicates the need to take immediate action. 1. Capillary refill of less than 3 seconds. 2. Left hand cooler than right. 3. Mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg. 4. Pressure bag at 300 mm Hg. Correct answer. Although the Allen's test is performed before cannulating the radial artery and determines the adequacy of ulnar artery blood flow, circulation to the extremity is monitored frequently. The nurse must assess color, capillary refill, sensation, temperature, and movement per institution policy. Impairment in any of these parameters must be reported immediately because it may indicate impaired circulation to the extremity, and removal of the catheter may be necessary. Option 1. Capillary refill of less than 3 seconds is an indicator of normal arterial circulation. Option 3. A mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg is adequate to perfuse the vital organs. Option 4, to maintain patency of the arterial blood pressure monitoring system, an intravenous bag of normal saline solution is placed in a pressure infuser device. The device is set to maintain continual pressure at 300 mm Hg. The pressure drops as the volume of solution in the bag decreases and can be pumped back up. This does not pose an immediate threat to the client. Educational Objective when caring for a client with a radial, brachial, or femoral arterial line in place. The nurse must be able to assess for complications. These include hemorrhage, infection, thrombus formation, and circulatory and neurovascular impairment. A nurse in the emergency department is caring for a homeless client just brought in with frostbite to the fingers and toes. The client is experiencing numbness and assessment shows mottled skin. Which interventions should be included in the client's plan of care? Select all that apply. 1. Apply occlusive dressings after rewarming. 2. Elevate affected extremities after rewarming. 3. 
Massage the areas to increase circulation. 4. Provide adequate analgesia. 5. Provide continuous warm water soaks. Correct answer. Explanation. Frostbite involves tissue freezing, resulting in ice crystal formation in intracellular spaces that causes peripheral vasoconstriction, reduced blood flow, vascular stasis, and cell damage. Superficial frostbite can manifest as mottled, blue, or waxy yellow skin. Deeper frostbite may cause skin to appear white and hard and unable to sense touch. This can eventually progress to gangrene. Treatment of frostbite should include the following. Remove clothing and jewelry to prevent constriction. Do not massage, rub, or squeeze the area involved. Injured tissue is easily damaged. Option 3. Immerse the affected area in water heated to 98.6 to 102.2 F. 37 to 39 C, preferably in a whirlpool. Higher temperatures do not significantly decrease rewarming time but can intensify pain, option 5. Avoid heavy blankets or clothing to prevent tissue sloughing. Provide analgesia as the rewarming procedure is extremely painful, option 4. As thawing occurs, the injured area will become edematous and may blister. Elevate the injured area after rewarming to reduce edema, option 2. Keep wounds open immediately after a water bath or whirlpool treatment and allow them to dry before applying loose, non-adherent. Sterile dressings, option 1. Monitor for signs of compartment syndrome. Educational objective. Care of the client with frostbite focuses on preventing further injury and reducing pain. This includes removing items that can cause constriction or sloughing, no massaging or rubbing of the injured area, providing warm water soaks and analgesia, elevating injured areas, applying loose non-adherent, sterile dressings, and monitoring for compartment syndrome. The nurse cares for an intubated client on mechanical ventilation with worsening cerebral edema from increased intracranial pressure, ICP. Which nursing interventions help reduce ICP? Select all that apply. 1. Clustering as many interventions as possible when providing care. 2. Hyperventilating before suctioning. 3. Maintaining a quiet, dark environment. 4. Maintaining the head in a neutral midline position. 5. Suctioning for 30 seconds to remove endotracheal tube secretions at regular intervals. Correct answer. Explanation. Most nursing activities increase intracranial pressure, IC, in brain injuries. The goal is to reduce ICP while managing basic client needs. During interventions, ICP should not exceed 25 mm Hg and should return to baseline within a few minutes. Metabolic demands, e.g., pain, straining, agitation, shivering, fever. Hypoxia, increase brain blood supply and raise ICP. Nursing interventions to control ICP include Elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees with the head, neck in a neutral position to reduce venous congestion, option 4. Administering stool softeners to reduce the risk of straining, e.g. Valsalva maneuver, managing pain well while monitoring sedation. Managing fever, e.g., cool sponges, ice, antipyretics, while preventing shivering. Maintaining a calm environment with minimal noise, e.g., alarms, television, hall noise, option 3. Ensuring adequate oxygenation, hyperventilating and pre-oxygenating the client before suctioning. Reducing CO2, a potent cerebral vasodilator, by hyperventilation induces vasoconstriction and reduces ICP, option 2. Option 1, stimulation increases oxygen metabolism within the brain, increasing the risk for irreversible brain damage and increased ICP. Limit performing interventions unless absolutely necessary and avoid performing interventions in clusters. Option 5. The nurse should suction a maximum of 10 seconds and only as necessary to remove secretions. Prolonged suctioning increases ICP. Educational objective. Nursing activities can increase intracranial pressure, IC, and should be limited and spread throughout the day.
The goal is to reduce ICP while managing basic needs. Nursing interventions include elevating the head of the bed, administering stool softeners, managing pain and fever, and maintaining a calm environment. The nurse is admitting a client with a possible diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. When collecting data to develop a plan of care for the client, the nurse should give priority to which of the following items. 1. Orthostatic blood pressure changes. 2. Presence or absence of knee reflexes. 3. Pupil size and reaction to light. 4. Rate and depth of respirations. Correct answer. Explanation. Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS, is an acute Immune-mediated polyneuropathy that is most often accompanied by ascending muscle paralysis and absence of reflexes. Lower extremity weakness progresses over hours to days to involve the thorax, arms, and cranial nerves, CNs. Neuromuscular respiratory failure is the most life-threatening complication. The rate and depth of the respirations should be monitored. Option 4. Measurement of serial bedside forced vital capacity, spirometry, is the gold standard for assessing early ventilation failure. Option 1. Autonomic dysfunction is common in BS and usually results in orthostatic hypotension, paralytic ileus, urinary retention, and diaphoresis. These complications need to be assessed but are not a priority. Option 2. Absence of knee reflexes is expected early in the course of GBS due to the ascending nature of the disease. Absence of gag reflex indicates GBS progression. Option 3. PERRLA. Pupils equal. Round. Reactive to light. Accommodation. Evaluation assesses CNs 2, 3, IV, and V. CN abnormalities are expected after the thoracic muscles, respiratory, are involved due to the ascending nature of GBS. Educational objective. The most serious complication to monitor for in new-onset Guillain-Barre syndrome is respiratory compromise from the paralysis ascending into the thoracic region. Monitoring for rate, depth of respirations and measuring serial bedside vital capacity, spirometry, help to detect this early in the disease course. A client with palpitations is admitted with supraventricular tachycardia. The client's heart rate is 210 per minute. Which is the most appropriate initial intervention? 1. Ask the client to bear down as if having a bowel movement. 2. Grab the crash cart and apply hands-free defibrillation pads. 3. Place ECG leads on client to further assess electrical activity. 4. Place IV line distally from the heart for adenosine administration. Correct answer. Clients with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, street, regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia, are initially treated with vagal maneuvers. The act of bearing down, as if having a bowel movement, valsalva, is an example of these maneuvers and may need to be attempted more than once. Vagal maneuvers work by increasing intrathoracic pressure and stimulating the vagus nerve, which supplies parasympathetic nerve fibers to the heart, resulting in slowed electrical conduction through the atrioventricular node. Option 2, cardioversion, not defibrillation, is used with this type of arrhythmia when it is refractory to medication. Cardioversion delivers a synchronized electrical current to the heart. This works by stopping the electrical activity to the heart and briefly allowing a normal heartbeat to return. Option 3, an ECG is used to diagnose street and can be obtained while or after the client is asked to perform the vagal maneuvers as it is not therapeutic. Option 4, adenosine is the drug of choice to treat street and has a 5 to 6 second half-life, the time it takes for the drug to be reduced to half of its original concentration. Placing the IV line as close as possible, not distal, to the heart is essential for the drug to have full effect. Adenosine is given rapidly over 1 to 2 seconds and then followed by a rapid 20 ml normal saline flush. Transient asystole is common, and clients often experience flushing and dizziness. Educational objective. 
Supraventricular tachycardia is a regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia with a rate of around 150 to 220 per minute. The best treatment is vagal maneuvers and adenosine IV push. The nurse is supervising a graduate nurse, GN, on a telemetry unit. An assigned client develops asystole with no pulse, and emergency care interventions are initiated. Which action by the GN would cause the supervising nurse to intervene? 1. Administers IV epinephrine. 2. Applies oxygen with bag mask. 3. Initiates chest compressions. 4. Provides defibrillator shock. Correct answer. Explanation. The client in asystole has a total absence of ventricular electrical activity and is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. The nurse should first verify the monitor reading by assessing the client and palpating for a pulse, and then call for help and initiate emergency care, i.e., CPR, oxygenated ventilation. Defibrillation is not indicated when there is no electrical activity present, i.e., asystole or when the heart muscle is not contracting despite an organized rhythm, i.e., pulseless electrical activity, p. Defibrillation attempts to convert lethal ventricular dysrhythmias, i.e., ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, into an organized rhythm by passing an electric shock through the heart. Defibrillation cannot create an organized rhythm if there is no electrical activity in the heart, option 4. Options 1, 2, and 3, immediate interventions for asystole and P include CPR and oxygenated ventilation. Advanced cardiovascular life support measures include epinephrine IV, placement of advanced airway, i.e. intubation, and treatment of reversible causes, e.g., hypovolemia, hyperkalemia. When treating systole or P, the absolute priority is providing continuous high-quality CPR and oxygenated ventilation until circulation spontaneously returns or the client enters into a shockable rhythm. Unfortunately, restoration of circulation may not be possible, and clients in asystole often cannot be resuscitated. Educational Objective Asystole is characterized by a total absence of ventricular electrical activity. The client is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. Treatment includes CPR, oxygenated ventilation, and advanced cardiovascular life support measures, e.g., epinephrine IV, advanced airway. Defibrillation is not effective for treatment of asystole or pulseless electrical activity. To obtain accurate continuous blood pressure readings via a radial arterial catheter, the nurse places the air-filled interface of the stopcock at the phlebostatic axis. Where is it located? 1. Angle of Lewis at second intercoastal space, ICS, to left of sternal border. 2. Aortic area at second ICS to right of sternal border. 3. Level of atria at 4th ICS, 1 half anterior posterior, AP, diameter. 4. 5 THICS at midclavicular line, MCL. Correct answer. Explanation. To measure pressures accurately using continual arterial and or pulmonary artery pressure monitoring, the zeroing stopcock of the transducer system must be placed at the phlebostatic axis. This anatomical location, with the client in the supine position, is at the fourth ICS. At the midway point of the AP diameter, one half AP, of the chest wall. If the transducer is placed too low, the reading will be falsely high. If placed too high, the reading will be falsely low. This concept is similar to the positioning of the arm in relation to the level of the heart when measuring blood pressure indirectly using a sphygmo manometer or non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. Device. The upper arm should be at the level of the phlebostatic axis. Option 1. The angle of Lewis is the palpable raised notch where the manubrium and sternum are joined. 
This anatomical location is useful in counting the ICSs and in finding auscultatory areas. Option 2, the aortic area is an auscultatory area located at the second ICS to the right of the sternal border. Option 4, the mitral area, apex, an auscultatory area, and the point of maximal impulse are located at the fifth ICS at the MCL. Educational Objective The anatomical location of the phlebostatic axis is the fourth ICS, at the midway point of the AP diameter, one half AP, of the chest wall. The stopcock nearest the transducer is placed here to assure accurate pressure measurements. Here are nursing practice questions that may help you. This is from 11 to 20. The nurse is caring for a client receiving mechanical ventilation. The ventilator begins alarming and displays an alert about low tidal volumes. The nurse checks the endotracheal tube and ventilator tubing but does not find any obvious cause of the alarm. The client's oxygen saturation is decreasing. What should the nurse do next? 1. Call the respiratory therapist to the bedside to troubleshoot the ventilator. 2. Elevate the head of the bed and apply a non-rebreather mask. 3. Increase the oxygen delivery setting on the ventilator to 100%. 4. Manually ventilate with a bag valve mask resuscitator attached to the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A low tidal volume alarm indicates that the volume of air being delivering by the ventilator is lower than the set volume. This is often due to a disconnection, loose connection, or leak in the ventilator circuit, e.g., tubing. Other causes include changes in the client's breathing efforts or leaking of air around the cuff of the endotracheal tube, ETT. The nurse should first troubleshoot common causes of the alarm but if the client is showing signs of inadequate oxygenation. The ventilator should be disconnected to allow manual ventilation with a bag valve mask, BVM, resuscitator connected to high flow oxygen, 15 L per minute, option 4. Option 1, respiratory therapists collaborate with nurses and have specialized training in mechanical ventilators. They should be called to the bedside, but the nurse should first begin stabilizing the client. Option 2, the inflated cuff of the ETT creates a seal against the walls of the trachea that ensures air movement is controlled through the tube, instead of passing around the tube. The inflated cuff also prevents aspiration of secretions or gastric contents into the lungs. A non-rebreather mask is ineffective in this case because air delivered through the nares and oropharynx cannot pass around the ETT cuff to reach the lungs. Option 3, the client would benefit from a higher oxygen concentration. However, changing this setting on the ventilator does not guarantee increased oxygen delivery to the client when the set volume of air is not being delivered. The client must be manually ventilated with a BVM resuscitator connected to supplemental oxygen. Educational Objective Ventilators will alarm when set parameters are not being met, e.g. Low tidal volumes. These alarms may indicate a change in client condition or ventilator malfunction. The nurse should manually ventilate the client with a bag valve mask resuscitator if an alarm cannot be quickly resolved and the client shows signs of respiratory distress. The nurse is caring for an 11-month-old child in the pediatric hospital. Which of these child's findings would be a common criterion to activate the rapid response team? Select all that apply. 1. New onset right-sided paralysis of extremities. 2. Pulse rate sustained at 120 per minute. 3. Respirations continued at 38 per minute. 4. Sudden inability to be aroused to an awake state. 5. Temperature of 101.3 F, 38.5 C. Correct answer. Rapid response teams are formed as a means to get critical care specialists to the bedside of clients who are not in a critical care unit when acute, significant changes occur in their condition. Each institution sets its own criteria, but it usually includes acute changes in heart rate, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, level of consciousness, and or urine output. Although strokes occur more commonly in adults, they can occur in children. 
Symptoms found in both groups can be similar, such as unilateral paralysis, which is usually found with vessel abnormalities or a hematologic complication, e.g., sickle cell, cancer, option 1. Just as in adults, emergency treatment for children should be activated. A sudden loss of consciousness is emergent in any client, option 4. Option 2. Normal heart rate for an infant, 1 to 12 months, is 100 to 160 per minute. Option 3. Normal respiration rate for an infant, 1 to 12 months, is 30 to 60 per minute. Option 5. A fever is ordinarily not an emergency situation that meets the criteria to activate the rapid response team. It can signal a serious condition in infants who are age less than 1 month or in children age less than 2 years who have a temperature greater than 104 F, 40 C, without a localized source, due to an immature immune system. However, in this case, it would probably be more effective to call a healthcare provider to prescribe appropriate diagnostic tests, e.g., complete blood count, cultures, and treatment, e.g., antibiotics. A fever does not usually require immediate life-saving intervention. Educational Objective Rapid response teams are formed as a means to get critical care assistance to the bedside of clients, not in intensive care, with acute significant changes in their condition. Common criteria include sudden, significant changes in pulse rate, respiration rate, systolic blood pressure, oxygen saturation, level of consciousness, and or urine output. The emergency department nurse is caring for a client who requires gastric lavage for a drug overdose. Which action would be appropriate? 1. Lavage through a small bore nasogastric tube. 2. Place client in Trendelenburg position during lavage. 3. Prepare intubation and suction supplies at the bedside. 4. Wait an hour after gastric decompression to initiate lavage. Correct answer. Gastric lavage, GL, is performed through an orogastric tube to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach. GL is rarely performed as it is associated with a high risk of complications, e.g. aspiration, esophageal or gastric perforation, dysrhythmias. GL is only indicated if the overdose is potentially lethal and if GL can be initiated within one hour of the overdose. Activated charcoal administration is the standard treatment for overdose, but it is ineffective for some drugs, e.g., lithium, iron, alcohol. Intubation and suction supplies should always be available at the bedside during GL in case the client develops aspiration or respiratory distress, option 3. Option 1. GL is usually performed through a large bore, 36 to 42 French, or a gastric tube so that a large volume of water or saline can be instilled in and out of the tube. Option 2, during GL. Clients should be placed on their side or with the head of bed elevated to minimize aspiration risk. Option 4, GL should be initiated within one hour of overdose ingestion to be effective. The client's stomach should be decompressed first, but lavage should be initiated as soon as possible afterwards. Educational Objective Gastric lavage is used to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach after a drug overdose. It should be initiated within one hour of overdose. The nurse should position the client to prevent aspiration and have emergency respiratory equipment at the bedside. The charge nurse is evaluating the skills of graduate nurses, GN, who are caring for clients with shock. Which action taken by a GN indicates a need for further education? 1. Administers furosemide to a client with elevated pulmonary artery wedge pressure in cardiogenic shock. 2. Applies an SpO2 sensor to the forehead of a client with septic shock rather than using a finger. 3. Raises the head of the bed to high fowler position for a client with hypovolemic shock. 4. Titrates norepinephrine infusion to maintain mean arterial pressure 265 mm Hg in a client with anaphylactic shock. Correct answer.
Hypovolemic shock occurs when there is inadequate circulating volume to maintain perfusion due to hemorrhage, decreased fluid intake, or fluid loss, e.g., vomiting, diarrhea, diuresis. Care of the client with shock includes restoring circulation, e.g., IV fluids. Positioning for a client with hypovolemic shock involves elevating the legs and maintaining the head of bed, hob, is less than or equal to 30 degrees. This allows gravity to assist with venous return, cardiac output, and perfusion of vital organs, e.g., brain, kidney. Raising the hob greater than 30 degrees, e.g., high fowler position, seated upright, is inappropriate in a client with hypovolemic shock and inadequate circulating vascular volume, option 3. Option 1, elevated pulmonary artery wedge pressure, normal. 6 to 12 mm Hg, is a manifestation of cardiogenic shock. Diuretics, e.g. furosemide, are appropriate for cardiogenic shock because decreasing left ventricular preload reduces cardiac workload. Option 2, placing the SpO2 sensor on the forehead rather than the finger can provide more accurate readings in clients with decreased peripheral tissue perfusion, e.g. shock, vasopressor therapy. Option 4, norepinephrine is a vasopressor used to increase stroke volume, cardiac output, and mean arterial pressure, MAP. Norepinephrine should be titrated to maintain MAP 265 mm Hg for a client in shock, e.g., anaphylactic. Educational Objective Positioning for a client with hypovolemic shock involves elevating the legs and maintaining the head of bed is less than or equal to 30 degrees to allow gravity to assist with venous return and increase cardiac output and perfusion. The nurse is caring for a client who is one day postoperative extensive abdominal surgery for ovarian cancer. The client is receiving IV ringers lactate at 100 milliliters per hour and continual epidural morphine for pain control. The Foley catheter urine output has decreased to less than 20 milliliters per hour over the past two hours. The postoperative hematocrit is 36%, 0.36, and the hemoglobin is 12 grams per deciliter, 120 grams per liter. Which action should the nurse carry out first? One. Assess vital signs. 2. Increase the IV rate to 125 milliliters per hour. 3. Notify the healthcare provider. 4. Perform a bladder scan. Correct answer. Third spacing of fluids can occur 24 to 72 hours after extensive abdominal surgery as a result of increased capillary permeability due to tissue trauma. It occurs when too much fluid moves from the intravascular into the interstitial or third space, a place between cells where fluid does not normally collect, i.e., injured site, peritoneal cavity. This fluid serves no physiologic purpose, cannot be measured, and leads to decreased circulating volume, hypovolemia, and cardiac output. The priority intervention is to assess vital signs as the manifestations associated with third spacing include weight gain, decreased urinary output, and signs of hypovolemia, such as tachycardia and hypotension. If third spacing is not recognized and corrected early on, postoperative hypotension can lead to decreased renal perfusion, prerenal failure, and hypovolemic shock, option 1. Option 2. Increasing the IV flow rate of the isotonic solution may be an appropriate intervention once the nurse has assessed the client, including taking a full set of vital signs. The nurse should intervene only after assessing to rule out other problems for which an increase in IV fluid intake would not be an appropriate solution, e.g., Foley catheter obstruction. Option 3. The nurse will notify the healthcare provider to report oliguria less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, after collecting all of the data necessary, i.e., vital signs. This is not the nurse's first action. Option 4, urinary retention is possible following surgery due to the adverse effects of anesthesia, opioids, anticholinergic drugs, and immobility. However, a bladder scan is not an appropriate action in this situation as the client has a Foley catheter.
Irrigating the catheter is the appropriate intervention if the nurse questions its patency. Educational objective. Third spacing can occur following extensive abdominal surgery and can lead to hypovolemia, decreased cardiac output, hypotension and tachycardia, and decreased urine output. Monitoring vital signs and urine output and maintaining IV fluids are appropriate interventions to prevent prerenal failure and hypovolemic shock. The nurse is caring for a client with sepsis and acute respiratory failure who was intubated and prescribed mechanical ventilation three days ago. The nurse assesses for which adverse effect associated with the administration of positive pressure ventilation, PPV. 1. Dehydration. 2. Hypokalemia. 3. Hypotension. 4. Increased cardiac output. Correct answer. Positive pressure ventilation, PP, delivers positive pressure to the lungs using a mechanical ventilator, MV. Either invasively through a tracheostomy or endotracheal tube or non-invasively through a nasal mask, face mask, nasal prongs, or a mouthpiece. The most common type used in the acute care setting for clients with acute respiratory failure is the volume-cycled positive pressure MV which delivers a preset volume and concentration of oxygen, e.g., 21% to 100%, with varying pressure. Positive pressure applied to the lungs compresses the thoracic vessels and increases intrathoracic pressure during inspiration. This leads to reduced venous return, ventricular preload, and cardiac output, which results in hypotension. The hypotensive effect of PP is even greater in the presence of hypovolemia, e.g., hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, and decreased venous tone, e.g., septic shock, neurogenic shock. Option 1. Fluid and or sodium retention usually occurs about 48 to 72 hours after initiation of PP due to 1. Increased intrathoracic pressure and decreased cardiac output that stimulate the kidneys to release renin. 2. Physiologic stress that leads to the release of antidiuretic hormone and cortisol. And 3. Breathing through the ventilator's closed circuitry, which decreases insensible loss associated with respiration. Option 2. Hypokalemia is not associated with PPV. Option 4. PP increases intrathoracic pressure and reduces venous return to the right side of the heart, reducing preload and cardiac output as well. Educational objective. Positive pressure ventilation causes increased intrathoracic pressure and reduced venous return and cardiac output, which can result in hypotension. The emergency department nurse receives a client with extensive injuries to the head and upper back. The nurse will perform what action to allow the best visualization of the airway? 1. Head tilt chin lift in the supine position on a backboard. 2. Head tilt chin lift in the Trendelenburg position. 3. Jaw thrust maneuver in semi Fowler's position. 4. Jaw thrust maneuver in the supine position on a backboard. Correct answer. Clinical situations involving trauma should follow ABC. Airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway assessment is particularly critical in clients with injuries to the head, neck, and upper back. Injury to the upper back should be treated as spinal trauma until the client has been cleared by an advanced trauma life support qualified healthcare provider. Until the spine is appropriately assessed, the client should be placed on a backboard and stabilized. The nurse should use the jaw thrust maneuver to avoid movement of an unstable spine. One provider should stabilize the cervical vertebra allowing the second provider to articulate the jaw independently of the spinal column. Option 1. Although use of the backboard is appropriate. The head tilt chin lift should not be used as it involves manipulation of the neck without proper stabilization. If the cervical vertebrae are fractured, the spinal cord could be badly damaged. Option 2. The head tilt chin lift does not stabilize the alignment of the head and neck and can cause spinal cord damage. In addition, the Trendelenburg position causes the abdominal organs to shift toward the diaphragm, which increases the work of breathing. 
Option 3, the jaw thrust maneuver is appropriate. But stabilization of the spine is best performed in the supine position, such as on the flat, hard surface of a backboard. Educational objective, if there is any suspicion of spinal injury, the jaw thrust maneuver should be used for airway assessment to avoid any shifting of unstable vertebrae and subsequent spinal cord damage. The nurse is caring for an intubated client whose oxygen saturation begins to drop. What action should the nurse take first? 1. Auscultate lung sounds bilaterally. 2. Hyperoxygenate with 100% oxygen. 3. Manually ventilate with bag valve mask. 4. Suction the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A drop in oxygen saturation signifies a problem with ventilation. When an artificial airway is present, the nurse should assess the client to determine the cause of hypoventilation. Auscultating lung sounds is the first step and quickest intervention to confirm proper tube placement. It is not uncommon for the tube to become displaced in the hypopharynx, which would not allow proper ventilation. Another important complication is pneumothorax, which can cause hypotension and a drop in oxygen saturation. Lung auscultation would help diagnose this as well. Option 2, hyperoxygenating would not increase ventilation if the tube is not in proper position or if the client has a pneumothorax. Option 3, the first step is to confirm tube placement. Manually ventilating through a displaced tube would produce no better results than use of the ventilator. Option 4, mucus plugs are a common cause of decreased oxygen saturation in the intubated client. There are, however, specific symptoms associated with this problem, including secretions backing up in the tube and high-pressure ventilator alarms. Although this client may still need suctioning even if these symptoms are not present, auscultating lung sounds is necessary to confirm tube placement before suctioning. Suctioning via a displaced tube could cause additional damage to the client's airway. Educational Objective Proper placement of the endotracheal tube is essential for adequate ventilation in intubated clients. If the tube becomes displaced in the hypopharynx, hypoxemia can result. Confirming the presence of equal breath sounds bilaterally via auscultation is an important initial nursing intervention. The intensive care nurse is caring for a client who has just been extubated. Which interventions are appropriate at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Administer prescribed oral narcotics for throat pain. 2. Administer warmed, humidified oxygen via face mask. 3. Give the client ice chips to moisten the mouth. 4. Provide mouth care with oral sponges. 5. Start the client on incentive spirometer. Correct answer. Recently extubated clients are at high risk for aspiration, airway obstruction, laryngeal edema and or spasm, and respiratory distress. To prevent complications, clients are placed in high fowler position to maximize lung expansion and prevent aspiration of secretions. Warmed, humidified oxygen is administered immediately after extubation to provide high concentrations of supplemental oxygen without drying out the mucosa option two oral care is provided to decrease bacteria and contaminants as well as promote comfort option four clients are instructed to frequently cough deep breathe and use an incentive spirometer to expand alveoli and prevent atelectasis option five Options 1 and 3, clients are kept NPO after extubation to prevent aspiration. They may have either a bedside swallow screen or a more formal swallow evaluation by a speech therapist prior to swallowing any food, drink, or medication. Educational Objective Recently extubated clients are immediately placed on humidified oxygen and monitored for aspiration, airway obstruction, and respiratory distress. Clients should remain no until swallowing function has been evaluated. In addition, clients should be given routine oral care as well as instructions on coughing, deep breathing, and use of incentive spirometry. A client is brought to the emergency department after his face slammed into a brick wall during a gang fight. 
Which client assessment finding is most important for the nurse to consider before inserting a nasogastric tube? 1. An echomotic area on the forehead. 2. Frontal headache rated as 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. 3. Nasal drainage NPO until swallowing function has been evaluated. In addition, clients should be given routine oral care as well as instructions on coughing, deep breathing, and use of incentive spirometry. A client is brought to the emergency department after his face slammed into a brick wall during a gang fight. Which client assessment finding is most important for the nurse to consider before inserting a nasogastric tube? 1. An echomotic area on the forehead. 2. Frontal headache rated as 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. 3. Nasal drainage on gauze has a red spot surrounded by serous fluid. 4. Small amount of bright red blood oozing from cheek laceration. Correct answer. Cerebrospinal fluid, CS, rhinorrhea, or CSF otorrhea, can confirm that a skull fracture has occurred and transverse the dura. If the drainage is clear, dextrose testing can determine if it is CSF. However, the presence of blood would make this test unreliable as blood also contains glucose. In this case, the halo ring test should be performed by adding a few drops of the blood-tinged fluid to gauze and assessing for the characteristic pattern of coagulated blood surrounded by CSF. Identification of this pattern is very important as CS leakage places the client at risk for infection. The client's nose should not be packed. No nasogastric or oral gastric tube should be inserted blindly when a basilar skull fracture is suspected as there is a risk of penetrating the skull through the fracture site and having the tube ascend into the brain. These tubes are placed under fluoroscopic guidance in clients with such fractures. Option 1. A bruise is an expected finding after direct trauma. It would be a concern if the echomosis were around the eyes, periorbital, raccoon eyes, or postericular. Bottle sign as this generally indicates a basilar skull fracture, a tear in the dura, and a potential CSF leak. Option 2. A headache is an expected finding after trauma. It would be a concern if it were unrelieved by non-narcotic analgesics or accompanied by signs of increased intracranial pressure. Option 4. The head is highly vascular and it is not unusual to have blood oozing after trauma. This is not as concerning as a potential CSF leak. However, it can become a problem if the nurse is unable to eventually stop the bleeding as substantial total blood loss is a concern. Educational Objective. A nasogastric tube should not be inserted when a basilar skull fracture is suspected. CSF leakage is an indication of this and can be evidenced by a positive halo ring test of the blood-tinged nasal drainage, coagulated blood surrounded by CSF. Here are nursing practice questions from 21 to 30. If you haven't subscribed yet, consider supporting my small channel. Thank you. A nurse is caring for an intubated client receiving a continuous sedative infusion. Which interventions by the nurse reflect correct understanding of preventing ventilator-acquired pneumonia? Select all that apply. 1. Elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees. 2. Performing hourly inline endotracheal suctioning. 3. Practicing strict hand hygiene. 4. Providing frequent oral care with chlorhexidine. 5. Scheduling daily sedation vacations. Correct answer. Mechanically ventilated clients are at risk for developing ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, due to sedation and impairment of natural defenses, like coughing by artificial airways. Interventions to reduce the risk of VAP include elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees, like Semi-fowler position, option 1. Providing oral care with antiseptic solutions, like chlorhexidine mouthwash and suctioning subglottic secretions, option 4. Performing scheduled daily sedation vacations and maintaining appropriate client sedation levels, option 5. 
Practicing strict hand hygiene, option 3. Option 2, endotracheal suctioning should be performed only when clinically indicated, like adventitious breath sounds, coughing, elevated peak airway pressure. Frequent suctioning increases the risk for tracheal and bronchial trauma, bleeding, and hypoxia. Educational objective. Mechanically ventilated clients are at risk for developing ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, due to sedation and use of an artificial airway. VAP prevention includes elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees, providing regular oral hygiene with chlorhexidine solution, practicing strict hand hygiene, and performing daily sedation vacations. Emergency medical service personnel are transporting a near-drowning victim who is currently hypothermic. Based on anticipated vital signs, the nurse needs to prepare for which interventions. Select all that apply. 1. Covering client with warm blankets. 2. Log rolling the client from side to side frequently. 3. Mechanical ventilation. 4. Warmed blood administration. 5. Warmed IV fluids. Correct answer. The initial management of a near-drowning victim focuses on airway management due to potential aspiration, leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary edema, or bronchospasm, leading to airway obstruction. Hypoxia is managed and prevented by ensuring a patent airway via intubation and mechanical ventilation as necessary. Option 3. Careful handling of the hypothermic client is important because as the core temperature decreases, the cold myocardium becomes extremely irritable. Frequent turning could cause spontaneous ventricular fibrillation and should not be performed during the acute stage of hypothermia. Continuous cardiac monitoring should be initiated. Option 2. There are passive, active external, and active internal rewarming methods. Passive rewarming methods include removing the client's wet clothing, providing dry clothing, and applying warm blankets. Active external rewarming involves using heating devices or a warm water immersion. Active internal rewarming is used for moderate to severe hypothermia and involves administering warmed IV fluids and warm humidified oxygen, options 1 and 5. Option 4, unless blood loss has occurred from trauma during the near-drowning incident, administration of blood products is not indicated. Educational Objective Emergency department care of near-drowning victims includes advanced airway management, aggressive oxygenation, establishing IV access and administering IV fluids, warmed if hypothermic, and monitoring for cardiac arrhythmias and fluid imbalances. The nurse is caring for a client in the immediate postoperative period following an exploratory laparotomy after sustaining a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Which assessment finding is most important for the nurse to report to the healthcare provider? 1. Cold and clammy skin. 2. Oxygen saturation of 92%. 3. Sinus tachycardia of 108 per minute. 4. Urine output of 0.6 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Correct answer. Hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, shock may occur after abdominal trauma or surgery as mesenteric edema resolves and previously compressed sites of bleeding reopen. The shock continuum is staged in severity from initial, I, to irreversible, IV. During the initial stage, there is inadequate oxygen to supply the demand at the cellular level and anaerobic metabolism develops. At this point, there may be no recognizable signs or symptoms. As shock progresses to the compensatory stage, sympathetic compensatory mechanisms are activated to maintain homeostasis, like oxygenation, cardiac output. Cold, clammy skin indicates failing compensatory mechanisms, like progressive stage, and immediate intervention is necessary to prevent irreversible shock and death, option 1. Option 2, slightly low oxygen saturation may occur when there is inadequate oxygen supply and increased metabolic demand. It is not the most important finding to report. Option 3, 
Sinus tachycardia is part of the compensatory response to maintain cardiac output and oxygen demand. It is not the most important finding to report. Option 4, as shock continues. The kidneys decrease filtration and increase reabsorption to maintain blood pressure, eventually resulting in decreased urinary output. Normal urine output is 0.5 to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour or greater than 30 milliliters per hour. Educational objective. Cold, clammy skin in a client with shock indicates that compensatory mechanisms are failing and that hypoperfusion is occurring. This should be reported promptly to the healthcare provider as immediate intervention is necessary to prevent irreversible shock. The student nurse observes the respiratory therapist, RT, preparing to draw an arterial blood gas from the radial artery. The RT performs the Allen's test and the student asks why this test performed before the blood sample is drawn. Which statement made by the RT is most accurate? 1. The Allen's test is done to determine if capillary refill is adequate. 2. The Allen's test is done to determine if the radial pulse is palpable. 3. The Allen's test is done to determine the patency of the ulnar artery. 4. The Allen's test is done to determine the presence of a neurologic deficit. Correct answer. The radial artery site at the wrist is preferred for collecting an arterial blood gas sample because it is near the surface, is easy to palpate and stabilize, and has good collateral supply from the ulnar artery. The patency of the ulnar artery can be confirmed with a positive modified Allen's test. The modified Allen's test includes the following steps. Instruct the client to make a tight fist, if possible. Occlude the radial and ulnar arteries using firm pressure. Instruct the client to open the fist. The palm will be white if both arteries are sufficiently occluded. Release the pressure on the ulnar artery. The palm should turn pink within 15 seconds as circulation is restored to the hand. Indicating patency of the ulnar artery, positive Allen's test. If the Allen's test is positive, the arterial blood gas can be drawn, if negative and the palm does not return to a pink color. An alternate site, e.g., brachial artery, femoral artery, must be used. Option 1. Capillary refill is tested by applying pressure to the fingernail bed to cause blanching. If refill is adequate, the nail bed should become pink in less than 3 seconds after pressure is released. Option 2. The radial artery is palpated with the fingertips to determine the presence of the radial pulse. Option 4. A neurologic deficit is assessed by monitoring color, sensation, and movement of the hand. Educational Objective The radial artery site at the wrist is preferred for collecting an arterial blood gas sample because it is near the surface, easy to palpate and stabilize, and has good collateral supply from the ulnar artery. The patency of the ulnar artery must be confirmed by performing a modified Allen's test to assure adequate circulation to the hand before proceeding with the arterial blood gas collection. A client with hypothermia has just arrived in the emergency department via ambulance. The client is being rewarmed with blankets, and the IV fluids are being changed over to warmed fluids. What additional intervention is a priority? 1. Attaching the cardiac monitor. 2. Covering the client's head. 3. Drawing blood for electrolytes and glucose. 4. Placing an additional large bore IV catheter. Correct answer. Hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is below 95 F, 35 C, and the body is unable to compensate for heat loss. As the core temperature decreases, the cold myocardium becomes extremely irritable and prone to dysrhythmias. The client should be handled gently as spontaneous ventricular fibrillation could develop when moved or touched. Therefore, placing the client on a cardiac monitor is a high priority. The nurse should anticipate defibrillation in these clients. Option 2. Covering the client's head is indicated to prevent heat loss. However, this can be done after the cardiac monitor has been attached. 
Depending on the severity of the hypothermia, the trunk should be warmed before the extremities to reduce the risk of after drop, core temperature drops further. This is due to cold peripheral blood returning to the central circulation. Option 3, a blood draw for laboratory testing is important but should be performed after the cardiac monitor is attached. Option 4, two large bore eye catheters are preferred. This can be accomplished after the cardiac monitor has been attached. Educational objective, cardiac monitoring and gentle handling of the client are a high priority with hypothermia. The cold myocardium is extremely irritable and prone to dysrhythmias. The nurse should anticipate defibrillation in these clients. The student nurse and the registered nurse are caring for a mechanically ventilated client with an acute lung injury. Which statement by the student nurse indicates a need for further education? 1. I will auscultate the neck to assess for endotracheal cuff leaks. 2. I will perform endotracheal suctioning routinely after oral care. 3. I will provide oral care and oral suctioning every two hours. 4. I will reposition the client from side to side at least every two hours. Correct answer. Endotracheal, ET. Suctioning improves ventilation in mechanically ventilated clients by removing mucus and secretions from the ET tube. Suctioning is performed based on clinical findings such as adventitious breath sounds, elevated peak airway pressure, coughing, or signs of acute respiratory distress. Frequent suctioning increases the risk of tracheal and bronchial trauma, bleeding, and hypoxia. Suctioning should be performed only when needed to reduce the risk for injury, option 2. Option 1, auscultating the neck to monitor for an ET tube cuff leak is a standard component of respiratory assessment in mechanically ventilated clients. The presence of a cuff leak increases the risk of accidental extubation, impairs ventilation, and allows aspiration of secretions from the mouth and throat. Option 3, oral care with oral suctioning is performed every two hours to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP. Secretions in the mouth and throat often contain bacteria that can cause pneumonia. Option 4. Repositioning clients at least every two hours reduces the occurrence of VAP. Turning clients side to side promotes mobilization of secretions and prevents secretions from pooling in dependent areas of the lungs. Educational Objective Endotracheal suctioning in mechanically ventilated clients should be performed based on assessment findings such as adventitious breath sounds, elevated peak airway pressure, coughing, or acute respiratory distress. Suctioning should be performed only when needed to reduce the risk of lung trauma and hypoxia. The flight nurse assesses an alert and oriented client at an industrial accident scene who was impaled in the abdomen by a pair of scissors. Which nursing action is the immediate priority on arrival at the scene? 1. Insert a large bore IV line and infuse normal saline. 2. Obtain blood for type and cross-match in hemoglobin. 3. Remove constrictive clothing to enhance circulation. 4. Stabilize the scissors with sterile bulky dressings. Correct answer. A sharp object that pierces the skin and lodges in the body may result in penetrating trauma to nearby tissue and organs. Common types of impaled, embedded, objects include bullets or blast fragments from firearms as well as sharp objects such as scissors, nails, or knives. The embedded object creates a puncture wound and then controls potential bleeding by putting pressure on the wound. First responders should not manipulate or remove the impaled object. Manipulation or removal may cause further trauma and bleeding, therefore, stabilization of the object is the first priority to prevent it from moving during initial client assessment, option 4, and later during transport to a healthcare facility where skilled trauma care is available. Exception to the rule, first responders, EMS providers, may remove the impaled object if it obstructs the airway and prevents effective cardiopulmonary resuscitation.
Option 1, an IV line may be inserted in fluids begun on scene after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Option 2, blood may be drawn after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Option 3, clothing may be removed on scene after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Educational Objective An impaled object should not be manipulated or removed at the scene as further trauma and bleeding of soft tissue and surrounding organs may occur. The embedded object is stabilized on scene to allow for initial client assessment and later transport to a healthcare facility where skilled trauma care is available. An intoxicated client not wearing a seatbelt drives into a metal barricade near the entrance to the emergency department. The client's head has hit the windshield, and the client is unconscious. What nurse actions are appropriate? Select all that apply. 1. Assess the client for a carotid pulse. 2. Determine the client's Glasgow Coma Scale score. 3. Maintain airway with head tilt, chin lift maneuver. 4. Place a hard cervical collar on the client. 5. Remove the client from the car onto a backboard. Correct answer. The transference of kinetic energy to the client's body from an opposing force during sudden deceleration, like fall, motor vehicle collision, causes bodily injury. If the client is not wearing a seatbelt during an automobile crash, the client may strike, or be propelled through, the windshield, causing blunt force trauma to the head, neck, or spine. The unconscious client should first be assessed for adequate breathing in the presence of a pulse, using the rule of airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs, option 1. Using a rigid cervical collar. Cervical spine immobilization must be maintained throughout the client assessment to minimize further injury, option 4. The client should be removed and placed on a backboard after the cervical spine has been stabilized, option 5. The nurse should also perform Glasgow Coma Scale scoring to determine the level of neurological impairment, option 2. Option 3, if a client with possible spinal injuries is not breathing, or if the airway is occluded, the nurse should use the jaw thrust technique. The head tilt, chin lift maneuver may hyperextend the neck, compromising the cervical spine. Educational objective. After sudden deceleration with blunt force head injury, the nurse first checks if the client is breathing and has a pulse, using the rule of airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs. Spinal injury should be presumed, and the cervical spine should be stabilized, e.g., cervical collar. The jaw thrust maneuver may be used to open the airway. A client with acute respiratory distress syndrome is receiving positive pressure mechanical ventilation with 15 cm H2O, 11 mm Hg, positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP. The nurse should assess for which complication associated with PEEP. 1. Barotrauma. 2. Decreased oxygen saturation. 3. Hypertension. 4. Oxygen toxicity. Correct answer. Positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, applies a given pressure at the end of expiration during mechanical ventilation. It counteracts small airway collapse and keeps alveoli open so that they can participate in gas exchange. PEEP is usually kept at 5 cm H2O, 3.7 mm Hg. However, a higher level of PEEP is an effective treatment strategy for acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. A type of progressive respiratory failure that causes damage to the type 2 surfactant producing pneumocytes that then leads to atelectasis, non-compliant lungs, poor gas exchange. And refractory hypoxemia high levels of PEEP, 10 to 20 centimeters h, o, 7.4 minus 14.8 millimeters hg, can cause over distension and rupture of the alveoli, resulting in barotrauma to the lung. Air from ruptured alveoli can escape into the pulmonary interstitial space or pleural space, resulting in a pneumothorax and or subcutaneous emphysema. Option 2, 
Peat opens up collapsed alveoli and improves gas exchange at a lower fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2, resulting in increased, not decreased, oxygen saturation. Option 3. Hemodynamic effects of PEEP include increased intrathoracic pressure, which leads to reduced venous return, decreased preload and cardiac output, and hypotension, not hypertension. Option 4. Keeping the alveoli open between breaths with PEEP improves gas exchange across the alveolar capillary membrane, reduces hypoxemia, and allows for the use of a lower FiO2 which can reduce the risk for oxygen toxicity. Educational objective. High PEEP is commonly used to prevent small airway alveolar collapse in clients with ADS. PEEP helps to reduce oxygen toxicity. However, high levels of PEEP, 10-20 cm H2O, 7.4-14.8 mm Hg, can cause barotrauma to the lung, resulting in a pneumothorax, and decreased venous return causes hypotension. The nurse is caring for a client receiving mechanical ventilation. The ventilator begins alarming and displays an alert about low tidal volumes. The nurse checks the endotracheal tube and ventilator tubing but does not find any obvious cause of the alarm. The client's oxygen saturation is decreasing. What should the nurse do next? 1. Call the respiratory therapist to the bedside to troubleshoot the ventilator. 2. Elevate the head of the bed and apply a non-rebreather mask. 3. Increase the oxygen delivery setting on the ventilator to 100%. 4. Manually ventilate with a bag valve mask resuscitator attached to the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A low tidal volume alarm indicates that the volume of air being delivering by the ventilator is lower than the set volume. This is often due to a disconnection, loose connection, or leak in the ventilator circuit, like tubing. Other causes include changes in the client's breathing efforts or leaking of air around the cuff of the endotracheal tube, ETT. The nurse should first troubleshoot common causes of the alarm, but if the client is showing signs of inadequate oxygenation, the ventilator should be disconnected to allow manual ventilation with a bag valve mask, BVM, resuscitator connected to high flow oxygen, 15 L per minute, option 4. Option 1, respiratory therapists collaborate with nurses and have specialized training in mechanical ventilators. They should be called to the bedside, but the nurse should first begin stabilizing the client. Option 2. The inflated cuff of the ETT creates a seal against the walls of the trachea that ensures air movement is controlled through the tube, instead of passing around the tube. The inflated cuff also prevents aspiration of secretions or gastric contents into the lungs. A non-rebreather mask is ineffective in this case because air delivered through the nares and oropharynx cannot pass around the ETT cuff to reach the lungs. Option 3, the client would benefit from a higher oxygen concentration. However, changing this setting on the ventilator does not guarantee increased oxygen delivery to the client when the set volume of air is not being delivered. The client must be manually ventilated with a BVM resuscitator connected to supplemental oxygen. Educational objective, ventilators will alarm when set parameters are not being met, like low tidal volumes. These alarms may indicate a change in client condition or ventilator malfunction. The nurse should manually ventilate the client with a bag valve mask resuscitator if an alarm cannot be quickly resolved and the client shows signs of respiratory distress. Tune in for the next video. 31 to 40 nursing practice questions. Like, comment, and subscribe. Here are RN practice questions from 31 to 40. Please consider subscribing my channel if you haven't. An emergency department nurse is sent to the scene of a massive motor vehicle collision. A client there reports neck pain. Which actions should the nurse perform at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Apply a hard cervical collar. 2. Assess neck range of motion. 3. Inspect client's respiratory pattern. 4. Position client flat on firm surface. 5. 
Use log rolling technique if moving client. Correct answer. The initial priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are to ensure a patent airway and immobilize the spine to prevent further injury. This includes applying a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, like backboard, and moving the client as a unit, log rolling, if required, options 1, 4, and 5. A soft foam cervical collar does not provide immobilization. Further stabilization is achieved by taping down the client's head and using straps to immobilize the arms, especially if the client is not cooperating. After immobilizing the client, the nurse should obtain a baseline set of vital signs to monitor for neurogenic shock, like hypotension, bradycardia, poikilothermia, like inability to regulate body temperature. A potential complication of spinal cord injury. The nurse should also assess the client's respiratory rate, pattern, and effort. Presence of abdominal breathing or increased work of breathing may indicate impending loss of airway and require prompt rapid sequence intubation, option 3. Option 2, movement of the neck, upper extremities should be avoided until cervical spine injury is ruled out with imaging, which is done after the spine is immobilized with a hard collar. Educational objective. The priorities for a client with a suspected cervical spine injury are maintaining a patent airway and spinal immobilization. Interventions include application of a rigid hard collar, placing the client on a firm surface, log rolling the client during movement and transfers, and continued assessment of need for an advanced airway. The intensive care nurse is caring for a client who has just been extubated. Which interventions are appropriate at this time? Select all that apply. 1. Administer prescribed oral narcotics for throat pain. 2. Administer warmed, humidified oxygen via face mask. 3. Give the client ice chips to moisten the mouth. 4. Provide mouth care with oral sponges. 5. Start the client on incentive spirometer. Correct answer. Recently extubated clients are at high risk for aspiration, airway obstruction, laryngeal edema and or spasm, and respiratory distress. To prevent complications, clients are placed in high fowler position to maximize lung expansion and prevent aspiration of secretions. Warmed, humidified oxygen is administered immediately after extubation to provide high concentrations of supplemental oxygen without drying out the mucosa, option 2. Oral care is provided to decrease bacteria and contaminants as well as promote comfort, option 4. Clients are instructed to frequently cough, deep breathe, and use an incentive spirometer to expand alveoli and prevent atelectasis, option 5. Options 1 and 3, clients are kept NPO after extubation to prevent aspiration. They may have either a bedside swallow screen or a more formal swallow evaluation by a speech therapist prior to swallowing any food, drink, or medication. Educational Objective Recently extubated clients are immediately placed on humidified oxygen and monitored for aspiration, airway obstruction, and respiratory distress. Clients should remain NPO until swallowing function has been evaluated. In addition, clients should be given routine oral care as well as instructions on coughing, deep breathing, and use of incentive spirometry. The nurse is caring for a client who had a near-drowning accident in cold weather. Which assessment finding indicates the most severe injury? 1. Decreased body temperature. 2. Toes pointed straight down. 3. Weak and thready pulse. 4. Wheezing on auscultation. Correct answer. Near drowning occurs when a client is underwater and unable to breathe for an extended period. In a matter of seconds, major body organs begin to shut down from lack of oxygen and permanent damage results. Decerebrate posturing is a sign of severe brain damage. During assessment, the nurse would observe arms and legs straight out toes pointed down, and the head, neck arched back. 
These assessment findings indicate that severe injury has occurred. Option 1. Hypothermia is generally seen in near-drowning victims. One of the first goals of treatment is to warm the client. This is done using warmed IV fluids, blankets, and air. Sustained hypothermia will eventually lead to organ failure, making this an urgent finding but not initially life-threatening. Option 3. A weak and thready pulse is generally detected in near-drowning victims due to hypothermia. Once the client is properly warmed, the pulse generally returns to normal. Sometimes the client is so cold that a pulse cannot be detected. This is why a client is not dead until warm and dead. Such clients may require prolonged resuscitation. Option 4. When wheezing is heard on auscultation after a near drowning, the first observation would be that the client is still moving air and providing oxygen to the body. The wheezing may indicate that the client has bronchospasm. If the client has aspirated fluid, crackles would be heard. Most such clients will develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. Educational objective. Decerebrate posturing. Arms and legs straight out. Toes pointed down. Head, neck arched back. Usually indicates severe brain injury. The nurse is caring for a client with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD. The client goes into ventricular tachycardia and is pulseless. The ICD has fired twice. What action should the nurse take? 1. Administer epinephrine 1 mg IV push. 2. Deactivate the ICD with a magnet. 3. Initiate chest compressions. 4. Take no action and let the ICD work. Correct answer. A client with an ICD that is firing is receiving electrical shocks from the internal defibrillator to interrupt the dysrhythmia. It is still imperative that the client receive chest compressions in the form of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, to provide circulation of blood to the vital organs. The nurse should implement the pulseless arrest algorithm, allowing 30 to 60 seconds for the ICD to complete its therapy cycle before applying external defibrillation pads, paddles. Option 1. Epinephrine should be administered after CPR and defibrillation. Option 2. The ICD is firing as it was programmed to do. It should not be deactivated. Option 4. The nurse should let the ICD work but needs to implement CPR in addition. Educational objective. The ICD is designed to defibrillate potentially life-threatening dysrhythmias. Although the device is able to sense electrical activity of the heart and respond, it is unable to sense or treat pulselessness. CPR should be initiated in the pulseless client with an ICD. A client with palpitations is admitted with supraventricular tachycardia. The client's heart rate is 210 per minute. Which is the most appropriate initial intervention? 1. Ask the client to bear down as if having a bowel movement. 2. Grab the crash cart and apply hands-free defibrillation pads. 3. Place ECG leads on client to further assess electrical activity. 4. Place IV line distally from the heart for adenosine administration. Correct answer. Clients with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, street, regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia, are initially treated with vagal maneuvers. The act of bearing down, as if having a bowel movement, Valsalva, is an example of these maneuvers and may need to be attempted more than once. Vagal maneuvers work by increasing intrathoracic pressure and stimulating the vagus nerve, which supplies parasympathetic nerve fibers to the heart, resulting in slowed electrical conduction through the atrioventricular node. Option 2, cardioversion, not defibrillation, is used with this type of arrhythmia when it is refractory to medication. Cardioversion delivers a synchronized electrical current to the heart. This works by stopping the electrical activity to the heart and briefly allowing a normal heartbeat to return. Option 3, an ECG is used to diagnose VT and can be obtained while or after the client is asked to perform the vagal maneuvers as it is not therapeutic. 
Option 4, adenosine is the drug of choice to treat SVT and has a 5 to 6 second half-life, the time it takes for the drug to be reduced to half of its original concentration. Placing the IV line as close as possible, not distal, to the heart is essential for the drug to have full effect. Adenosine is given rapidly over 1 to 2 seconds and then followed by a rapid 20 ml normal saline flush. Transient asystole is common, and clients often experience flushing and dizziness. Educational Objective Supraventricular tachycardia is a regular, narrow QRS complex tachycardia with a rate of around 150 to 220 per minute. The best treatment is vagal maneuvers and adenosine IV push. A two-year-old at an outpatient clinic stops breathing and does not have a pulse. CPR is initiated. When the automated external defibrillator, AED, arrives, the nurse notes that it has only adult AED pads. What is the appropriate action at this time? 1. Continue CPR without using the automated external defibrillator, AED, until paramedics arrive. 2. Place one AED pad on the chest and the other on the back. 3. Place one AED pad on the upper right chest and the other on the lower left side. 4. Place one AED pad on the upper right chest and dispose of the other. Correct answer. An automated external defibrillator, AD, should be used as soon as it is available. Pediatric AED pads or a pediatric dose attenuator should be used for children age birth to 8 years if available. Standard adult pads can be used as long as they do not overlap or touch. If adult AED pads are used, one should be placed on the chest and the other on the back, sandwiching the heart. Option 1. If an AED is available, it should be placed on the client as soon as possible. Research shows that survival rates increase when CPR and defibrillation occur within 3 to 5 minutes of arrest. Option 3. Standard placement of adult AD pads on a 2-year-old would cause the pads to touch or overlap. Touching or overlapping of pads allows the shock to move directly from one pad to the other without traveling through the heart. Option 4. Both AD pads are necessary for the defibrillator to work effectively. Educational Objective. An automated external defibrillator, AED, should be used as soon as it is available. Adult AD pads can be used on a pediatric client if pediatric pads are unavailable. One pad is placed on the chest and the other is placed on the back, sandwiching the heart. The emergency department nurse is caring for a client who requires gastric lavage for a drug overdose. Which action would be appropriate? One. Lavage through a small bore nasogastric tube. 2. Place client in Trendelenburg position during lavage. 3. Prepare intubation and suction supplies at the bedside. 4. Wait an hour after gastric decompression to initiate lavage. Correct answer. Gastric lavage, GL, is performed through an orogastric tube to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach. GL is rarely performed as it is associated with a high risk of complications, like aspiration, esophageal or gastric perforation, dysrhythmias. GL is only indicated if the overdose is potentially lethal and if GL can be initiated within one hour of the overdose. Activated charcoal administration is the standard treatment for overdose, but it is ineffective for some drugs, like, lithium, iron, alcohol. Intubation and suction supplies should always be available at the bedside during GL in case the client develops aspiration or respiratory distress, option 3. Option 1. GL is usually performed through a large bore, 36 to 42 French, or a gastric tube so that a large volume of water or saline can be instilled in and out of the tube. Option 2. During GL. Clients should be placed on their side or with the head of bed elevated to minimize aspiration risk. Option 4. GL should be initiated within one hour of overdose ingestion to be effective. The client's stomach should be decompressed first, but lavage should be initiated as soon as possible afterwards. Educational Objective 
Gastric lavage is used to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach after a drug overdose. It should be initiated within one hour of overdose. The nurse should position the client to prevent aspiration and have emergency respiratory equipment at the bedside. The nurse is supervising a graduate nurse, GN, on a telemetry unit. An assigned client develops asystole with no pulse, and emergency care interventions are initiated. Which action by the GN would cause the supervising nurse to intervene? 1. Administers IV epinephrine. 2. Applies oxygen with bag mask. 3. Initiates chest compressions. 4. Provides defibrillator shock. Correct answer. The client in asystole has a total absence of ventricular electrical activity and is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. The nurse should first verify the monitor reading by assessing the client and palpating for a pulse, and then call for help and initiate emergency care, like CPR, oxygenated ventilation. Defibrillation is not indicated when there is no electrical activity present, like asystole, or when the heart muscle is not contracting despite an organized rhythm, like pulseless electrical activity, P. Defibrillation attempts to convert lethal ventricular dysrhythmias, like ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, into an organized rhythm by passing an electric shock through the heart. Defibrillation cannot create an organized rhythm if there is no electrical activity in the heart, option 4. Options 1, 2, and 3, immediate interventions for asystole and P include CPR and oxygenated ventilation. Advanced cardiovascular life support measures include epinephrine IV, placement of advanced airway, like intubation, and treatment of reversible causes, like hypovolemia, hyperkalemia. When treating systole or P, the absolute priority is providing continuous high-quality CPR and oxygenated ventilation until circulation spontaneously returns or the client enters into a shockable rhythm. Unfortunately, restoration of circulation may not be possible, and clients in asystole often cannot be resuscitated. Educational objective. Asystole is characterized by a total absence of ventricular electrical activity. The client is pulseless, apneic, and unresponsive. Treatment includes CPR, oxygenated ventilation, and advanced cardiovascular life support measures, like epinephrine IV, advanced airway. Defibrillation is not effective for treatment of systole or pulseless electrical activity. The nurse is caring for a client on a mechanical ventilator. The settings on the ventilator have just been changed. And the standing prescription is to draw arterial blood gases 30 minutes after a ventilator change. In anticipation of this blood draw, what intervention should the nurse implement? 1. Avoid suctioning the client. 2. Pre-oxygenate the client. 3. Raise the head of the bed. 4. Reduce the amount of sedation medication. Correct answer. Arterial blood gases, ABS, indicate the acid-base balance in the body and how well oxygen is being carried to the tissues. It is common to measure ABS after a ventilator change to assess how well the client has tolerated it. Factors such as changes in the client's activity level or oxygen settings or suctioning within 20 minutes prior to the blood draw can cause inaccurate results. Unless the client's condition dictates otherwise, the nurse should avoid suctioning as it will deplete the client's oxygen level and cause inaccurate test results. Option 2. Pre-oxygenation should occur prior to suctioning and possibly before position changes. It will affect ABG results. Option 3. The head of the bed should be maintained at 30 degrees or higher in an intubated client to prevent aspiration and allow for adequate chest expansion. This position will not affect ABG results. Option 4. If a client is being weaned from the ventilator, sedation may be reduced. A client with reduced sedation may become anxious and have an increased activity level. These could affect the ABG results. 
educational objective, if the client's condition allows. The nurse should avoid suctioning or changing activity or oxygenation levels prior to drawing of ABGs. These actions can result in inaccurate ABG results. When caring for a client with a left radial artery catheter, which assessment data obtained by the nurse indicates the need to take immediate action. 1. Capillary refill of less than 3 seconds. 2. Left hand cooler than right. 3. Mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg. 4. Pressure bag at 300 mm Hg. Correct answer. Although the Allen's test is performed before cannulating the radial artery and determines the adequacy of ulnar artery blood flow, circulation to the extremity is monitored frequently. The nurse must assess color capillary refill, sensation, temperature, and movement per institution policy. Impairment in any of these parameters must be reported immediately because it may indicate impaired circulation to the extremity, and removal of the catheter may be necessary. Option 1, capillary refill of less than 3 seconds is an indicator of normal arterial circulation. Option 3, a mean arterial pressure of 65 mm Hg is adequate to perfuse the vital organs. Option 4, to maintain patency of the arterial blood pressure monitoring system, an intravenous bag of normal saline solution is placed in a pressure infuser device. The device is set to maintain continual pressure at 300 mm Hg. The pressure drops as the volume of solution in the bag decreases and can be pumped back up. This does not pose an immediate threat to the client. Educational objective. When caring for a client with a radial, brachial, or femoral arterial line in place, the nurse must be able to assess for complications. These include hemorrhage, infection, thrombus formation, and circulatory and neurovascular impairment. Here are nursing practice questions from 41 to 50. If you didn't subscribe to our channel please consider it. The nurse is educating a client with myasthenia gravis about avoiding acute symptom exacerbation, myasthenic crisis. Which of the following client statements indicate a correct understanding of the teaching? Select all that apply. 1. I should eat semi-solid foods instead of solid foods. 2. I should still receive a flu vaccine annually. 3. I should use a bladder training schedule to prevent incontinence. 4. Will plan to get my errands done in the evening. 5. I will take my medication before meals. Correct answer. Myasthenia gravis, MG, is an autoimmune neuromuscular disease that involves the attack of acetylcholine receptors by autoantibodies at the neuromuscular junction. The deficit acetylcholine receptors cause fluctuating skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue. Myasthenic crisis is an exacerbation of MG due to disease progression, deficiency in anticholinesterase, illness, or stress. Interventions to manage MG and prevent myasthenic crisis at home include Eating semi-solid, easily chewed, foods instead of solids or liquids to conserve energy and prevent choking, aspiration. Option 1. Receiving an annual flu vaccine to prevent infection and undue stress. On the respiratory system and muscles. Option 2. Taking acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, like pyridostigmine. Neostigmine, before meals so that peak effects of the medication help the client to eat and swallow food. Option 5, Option 3, MG affects the skeletal muscles, which do not impact a client's ability to void. Bowel and bladder function would be affected by dysfunction of the reflexes or the CNS, like multiple sclerosis. Option 4, for clients with MG, Skeletal muscles tend to be stronger in the morning and weaken throughout the day. Clients should plan most of their daily activities in the morning when strength and energy are highest. Educational objective. Myasthenia gravis causes decreased numbers of acetylcholine receptors in skeletal muscles, which causes skeletal muscle weakness and fatigue. 
Interventions to manage myasthenia gravis and prevent myasthenia crisis include consuming semi-solid foods, receiving annual flu vaccines, and taking anticholinesterase medications before meals. A client with ulcerative colitis is prescribed the drug sulfasalazine. Which information should the nurse discuss with the client concerning this drug? Select all that apply. 1. Drinking 8 glasses of water daily. 2. Stopping the medicine if blood is present in stool. 3. Stopping the medicine if urine turns an orange-yellow color. 4. Taking folic acid supplements. 5. Wearing sunscreen when outdoors. Correct answer. Sulfasalazine, azulfidine, is a sulfonamide, salicylate and sulfa antibiotic, and non-biologic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, DMARD, used for mild to moderate chronic inflammatory rheumatoid. Arthritis, raw, and inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis. It inhibits the production of prostaglandin, a mediator in the body's inflammatory response. Most sulfa medications, like trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, share common side effects, including crystalluria causing kidney injury. Clients should drink 8 glasses of water daily to maintain adequate urine output, 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters per day. Photosensitivity and risk for sunburn. Clients should avoid sun exposure and apply sunscreen. Folic acid deficiency megaloblastic anemia and stomatitis, clients should eat folate-rich foods and take 1 mg per day folic acid supplement. Rarely life-threatening agranulocytosis, leukopenia, clients should be monitored for complete blood count at the start of therapy and report fever or sore throat immediately. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, clients should stop the medicine if rash develops. Option 2, ulcerative colitis is characterized by bloody diarrhea, and the medication is taken to reduce this effect. Option 3, urine and skin can turn an orange-yellow color but will return to normal when the drug is discontinued. This is an expected finding. Educational Objective Sulfasalazine, azulfidine, is used for mild to moderate chronic inflammatory raw and inflammatory bowel disease. Important adverse effects include crystalluria with kidney injury, yellow-orange skin and urine discoloration, folic acid deficiency, and photosensitivity. The nurse is performing a postpartum assessment 12 hours after the prolonged vaginal delivery of a term infant. Which assessment findings should be reported to the healthcare provider? 1. Complaints of discomfort during fundal palpation. 2. Foul-smelling lochia. 3. Oral temperature 100.1 F, 37.8 C. 4. White blood cell, WBC, count 24.000 M3. Correct answer. A foul odor of lochia suggests endometrial infection. This client has an increased risk of infection due to her prolonged labor, which involved multiple cervical examinations. The odor of lochia is usually described as fleshy or musty. A foul smell warrants further evaluation. Other signs of endometrial infection are maternal fever, tachycardia, and uterine pain, tenderness. Option 1. Palpation of the postpartum uterine fundus is commonly uncomfortable for the client. If the client complains of increasing pain, further evaluation is needed. Option 3. Major signs and symptoms of endometrial infection include temperature above 100.4 F, 38.0 C, chills, malaise, excessive uterine tenderness, and purulent, foul-smelling lochia. During the first 24 hours postpartum, the temperature is normally elevated. Temperature above 100.4 F, 38 C, requires further evaluation. Option 4, the WBC count is normally elevated during the first 24 hours postpartum up to 30,000 per millimeter. Leukocyte levels that are not decreasing require further evaluation. Educational Objective 
Signs of endometrial infection include elevated temperature, chills, malaise, excessive pain, and foul-smelling lachia. During the first 24 hours postpartum, temperature and WBC count are normally elevated. Fever and leukocyte counts that do not decrease require further evaluation. The nurse is caring for a client in the first trimester during an initial prenatal clinic visit. Based on the information provided by the client, which factor places the client at an increased risk for preterm labor? 1. Age 25. 2. Periodontal disease. 3. Vegetarian diet. 4. White ethnicity. Correct answer. Preterm birth is defined as birth before 37 weeks and 0 days gestation. Infection, like periodontal disease, urinary tract infection, is strongly associated with preterm labor. Particularly when untreated, option 2. Infection causes release of inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins, which are uterotonic, promote contractions, and contribute to cervical softening. Some risk factors for preterm birth may be modifiable with lifestyle changes and early treatment. Risk factors should be addressed at the initial and each subsequent prenatal visit to allow for early identification and management. Some risk factors for preterm birth include History of spontaneous preterm birth in a previous pregnancy Single largest independent risk factor Previous cervical surgery, such as a cone biopsy, weakens cervical support Tobacco and or illicit drug use Option 1 Maternal ages less than 17 and greater than 35 are associated with increased risk for preterm birth. Maternal age of 25 is not a risk factor. Option 3. Maternal undernutrition can increase the risk for preterm birth and low infant birth weight. However, a balanced vegetarian diet with adequate pregnancy weight gain does not increase preterm birth risk. Option 4. Non-Hispanic black women have the highest rates of preterm labor and birth. Non-Hispanic white ethnicity is not a risk factor for preterm birth. Educational objective. Infection, like periodontal disease. Urinary tract infection, places pregnant clients at increased risk for preterm labor and birth. Other risk factors include history of preterm birth, previous cervical surgery tobacco, illicit drug use, and maternal age less than 17 or greater than 35. The nurse is administering a pink pill to a hospitalized medical surgical client. The alert, oriented client says, This is a pill I haven't seen before. What follow-up action should the nurse take next? 1. Check the healthcare provider's prescription in the medical record. 2. Explain that the healthcare provider has prescribed the medication. 3. Look up the medication in the pharmacology reference. 4. Teach the client about the purpose of the medication. Correct answer. When a mentally competent client questions a drug administration, the safest option is to first check the prescription to verify the six rights of medication administration, option 1. If an error is ruled out, like different brand, new order, the nurse should follow up with appropriate teaching. Option 2. The nurse must first verify all aspects of proper medication administration. If they are correct, the nurse should provide appropriate teaching on why the healthcare provider prescribed the medication. Explaining that the nurse is just following orders is rarely the correct answer. Option 3. A pharmacology reference can verify information about the medication but will not confirm that the client is the correct recipient. Acceptable identifiers include first and last name, medical record number, and birth date. Option 4. The nurse can teach the client about the purpose of the medication after the six rights have been verified. Educational objective. When a competent client questions a new medication, the nurse should first verify the six rights of safe medication administration. Right client, medication, dose, route, time, and documentation.
If safe administration has been confirmed, the nurse should then provide appropriate teaching to the client. A client is receiving a continuous heparin infusion and the most recent APTT is 140 seconds. The nurse notices blood oozing at the surgical incision and eye insertion sites. What interventions should the nurse implement? Select all that apply. 1. Continue heparin infusion and recheck APTT in 6 hours. 2. Prepare to administer vitamin K3. Redraw blood for laboratory tests. 4. Review guidelines for administration of protamine. 5. Stop infusion of heparin and notify the healthcare provider, HCP. Correct answer. Depending on the institution and HCP, a therapeutic APTT level for a client being heparinized is somewhere between 46 to 70 seconds, 1.5 to 2.0 times the baseline value. An APTT of 140 seconds is too long and this client is showing signs of bleeding. The nurse should stop the heparin infusion, notify the HCP, and review administration guidelines for possible administration of protamine, reversal agent for heparin. Option 1. Continuing the heparin infusion will put the client at risk for a severe bleeding episode. Option 2. Vitamin K is the reversal agent for warfarin. Option 3. There is no reason to redraw blood for laboratory workup at this time as the abnormal APTT result is consistent with the client's bleeding. Laboratory studies may need to be redone within one hour of stopping the infusion or giving a reversal agent. Educational objective. The nurse should stop the infusion of heparin when there is evidence of bleeding. The HCP should be notified immediately and the nurse should be prepared to give protamine if ordered. A 7-year-old client receives a scalp laceration to the back of the head while on a playground, and the new nurse prepares to irrigate the wound. Which actions by the new nurse would require the experienced nurse to intervene? Select all that apply. 1. Administers the prescribed analgesic 30 minutes before irrigating the wound. 2. Cleanses the wound from the most to the least contaminated area. 3. Obtains a 10 ml syringe and a 27 gauge needle. 4. Reviews the child's most recent immunization record. 5. Uses continuous pressure to irrigate and repeats until drainage is clear. Correct answer. Before an open wound is closed, irrigation is performed to wash out debris and bacteria to ensure appropriate wound healing. This is important for wounds obtained in an outdoor environment, like playground, as contamination with soil or dirt greatly increases the risk of infection. To perform wound irrigation, administer the analgesic 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure to allow medication to reach therapeutic effect. Option 1. Don a gown and mask with face shield to protect from splashing fluid and sterile. Gloves to maintain surgical asepsis and prevent infection. Fill a 30 to 60 ml sterile irrigation syringe with the prescribed irrigation solution. Attach an 18 or 19 gauge needle or angio catheter to the syringe and hold one in 2.5 cm above the area. Use continuous pressure to flush the wound, repeating until drainage is clear. Option 5. Dry the surrounding wound area to prevent skin breakdown and irritation. Immunization history is reviewed to determine tetanus vaccination status. Option 4. Typically, a tetanus vaccination is administered if the client has not had one within the last 5 to 10 years. Depending on the contamination level of the wound, Option 2. Wounds should be cleaned from the least to the most contaminated area to prevent recontamination. Option 3. A 10 ml syringe would require frequent refilling. A larger syringe is more appropriate. The narrow lumen of a 27 gauge needle would provide excessive irrigation pressure. Educational objective. Open wounds must be free of dirt and bacteria prior to closure to reduce the risk of infection. Wound irrigation requires surgical asepsis. 
The nurse is performing post-delivery care of a newborn delivered at 35 weeks gestation. Which of the following actions by the nurse are appropriate? Select all that apply. 1. Covers the scale with warm blankets before weighing the newborn. 2. Encourages skin-to-skin -skin contact between the stable newborn and mother. 3. Performs diaper changes underneath a radiant warmer. 4. Places the identification band on the newborn before beginning to dry off amniotic fluid. 5. Transfers the swaddled newborn to the neonatal intensive care unit in an open bassinet. Correct answer. Preterm newborns are at high risk for cold stress due to immaturity of the thermoregulatory center in the brain, inadequate subcutaneous fat, and an inability to initiate shivering. These attributes make it difficult for the preterm newborn to maintain normal body temperature, axillary temperature of 97.7 to 99.5 F. Covering the scale with warmed blankets protects against conductive heat loss, which may occur when the newborn's skin comes into contact with a cooler surface. Option 1. Skin-to-skin -skin contact with the parents for stable. Preterm newborns promotes thermoregulation through conduction of body heat to the newborn. Option 2. Radiant warmers and incubators provide heat through convection and are routinely used to help newborns regulate their core temperatures. Providing care underneath the radiant warmer protects newborns from convection heat loss by reducing exposure to the cooler ambient environment and air drafts. Option 3. Option 4. Drying the newborn completely of amniotic fluid immediately following birth protects the newborn from heat loss by evaporation and should occur prior to or simultaneously with other interventions. Option 5. The preterm newborn should be transferred from the birthing room to the intensive care unit via a pre-warmed incubator to prevent heat loss by convection. Educational Objective. Preterm newborns are at increased risk for cold stress and heat loss. The nurse can help prevent cold stress by covering cool surfaces with warm blankets, completely drying the newborn after birth. Providing care in the radiant warmer, transferring the newborn in a pre-warmed incubator, and encouraging skin-to-skin -skin contact. It is the first day on the job for the newly hired unlicensed assistive personnel, UAP. Which of these illustrate appropriate delegation instructions for the registered nurse, RN, to give the UAP? Select all that apply. 1. Elevate the right leg on two pillows. 2. Measure client for compression stockings. 3. Please let me know what the urine looks like. 4. Tell me what the client eats at lunch. 5. Verify wrist restraints are on correctly. Correct answer. Directions to the unlicensed assistive personnel. Up should be for tasks versus total client responsibility with specific and explicit requirements versus those requiring analysis, judgment, evaluation. The nursing process. Elevate leg on two pillows is very specific and does not require specialized knowledge or skill. Option 1. Report what the client eats at lunch is data collection only. Option 4. The RN will analyze the data to see if the amount of food is adequate. Option 2, the UAP may apply compression stockings or devices. But the RN or LP should measure the client to choose the appropriate size as this is beyond the UP's scope of practice. Option 3, this involves an assessment that the RN should perform. The RN could ask for specific data, such as amount of urine or presence of blood clots. Option 5. This requires a judgment. Is the restraint tight enough, too tight and causing impaired circulation? That the RN should make. The UAP could be assigned a specific task, such as offering a drink to the client. Educational objective. Assign a new up specific tasks that do not require specialized knowledge or skills. The UAP can gather data but should not be asked to assess, analyze, evaluate, or measure client for compression devices.
The emergency department nurse is obligated to make a report for which situations. Select all that apply. 1. To a client's employer that the client had a car crash while intoxicated. 2. To the authorities that an elderly client has suspicious bruising but denies caregiver abuse. 3. To the medical examiner of a death following trauma, even if the family refuses autopsy. 4. To the spouse of a client that the client has a reportable sexually transmitted disease. 5. To the supervisor that an oncoming healthcare provider has the smell of alcohol on the breath. Correct answer. There are several circumstances in which the nurse is legally required to report to appropriate civil authorities. Suspected elder abuse must be reported to the appropriate authorities for investigation. The nurse has a legal obligation to report signs of abuse regardless of client's ability or willingness to advocate for themselves, option 2. The nurse should report deaths that meet medical examiner reporting guidelines, like suspected to be the result of a crime, trauma, or suicide to the authorities for investigation. The local medical examiner has the legal authority and obligation to perform an autopsy independent of the family's wishes, option 3. For the sake of client safety, nurses should immediately report impaired or intoxicated healthcare workers, regardless of their position, option 5. Under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, a client's reason for an emergency department visit cannot be communicated to employers without the client's permission, option 1. Health authorities must be notified of a reportable sexually transmitted disease regardless of client wishes. Depending on the condition, authorities may report findings to sexual contacts. But it is a violation of client privacy for the nurse to share this information with the client's family or spouse, option 4. Educational objective. The nurse is required to report an impaired co-worker, a suspicious death, and elder abuse to appropriate authorities. The nurse is legally prohibited from sharing health information with employers or family members without the client's permission. If you like this content, please like, comment, and subscribe. Here are nursing practice questions from 51 to 60. Please subscribe for more videos like this. The nurse is caring for an agitated client with dementia who is pulling at the oxygen and IV tubing. Wrist restraints are applied after less restrictive safety measures have been ineffective. Which actions are appropriate to protect the client from injury? Select all that apply. 1. Attach wrist restraint straps to the upper side rails. 2. Position the client supine to keep restraint straps taut. 3. Release restraints at regular intervals and assess behavior. 4. Use a square knot to tie restraint straps to the bed. 5. Use gauze to pad bony prominences under restraints. Correct answer. When caring for a client in restraints, the nurse should implement these interventions at regular intervals, according to agency policy, every two hours. Provide skin care and range of motion exercises. Ensure basic needs are met, like fluids, nutrition, elimination. Assess skin integrity and neurovascular status of restrained extremities. Pad bony prominences under restraints, if necessary, to protect skin, option 5. Determine the need for continued restraint by releasing restraints briefly and assessing the client's reaction. Regularly assessing the need for restraints promotes discontinuation as soon as possible, option 3. Option 1. Restraint straps should be attached to areas that move with the bed frame, like elevates with the frame and head of the bed. Areas that do not move with, base, or move independently of, side rails. The frame should never be used, as injury may occur when they are raised or lowered, like pulling, entrapment. Option 2. Supine positioning increases aspiration risk as the client may be unable to self-reposition if vomiting occurs. 
Side-lying or semi-fowler position promotes drainage of emesis or oral secretions. Option 4. Restraint straps should be tied in a quick-release knot, in case of emergency, and never in a square knot, which is difficult to release quickly. Educational Objective Nurses caring for restrained clients must ensure that basic needs are met. Assess skin integrity and neurovascular status of restrained extremities and determine the need for continued use. Supine position is avoided to decrease aspiration risk. Quick release knots are used to attach restraints to parts of the bed frame that move with bed position changes. The nurse is caring for a client receiving IVPB azithromycin. Which client data obtained by the nurse should be reported to the healthcare provider, HCP, prior to administering any additional doses? 1. Currently nauseated and vomited once. 2. Decreased white blood cell, WBC, count. 3. Prolonged QT interval. 4. Temperature of 101.4 F, 38.6 C. Correct answer. All macrolide antibiotics, like azithromycin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, can cause a prolonged QT interval, which may lead to sudden cardiac death due to torsades de points. Therefore, an electrocardiogram, ECG, should be monitored. Concurrent use of macrolide antibiotics with other drugs that prolong QT interval like amiodarone, sotalol, haloperidol, zapracidone. Azole antifungals will further increase this risk. Macrolides can also cause hepatotoxicity when taken in high doses or in combination with other hepatoxic medications such as acetaminophen, phenothiazines, and sulfonamides. Elevation of aspartate transaminase and alanine transaminase levels, liver enzymes, may indicate that hepatotoxicity is occurring. And the nurse should report these results to the HCP. Option 1. Nausea and vomiting can be side effects of azithromycin. They are not as concerning as the adverse reaction of prolonged QT interval. Option 2. A decrease in the WBC count would be expected as infection is resolving. Option 4. Fever may be present in a client with an infection. The nurse should use as needed acetaminophen cautiously in a client also receiving azithromycin due to the risk of hepatotoxicity. Educational Objective. Macrolide antibiotics, like erythromycin. Azithromycin, clarithromycin, can cause QT prolongation, which can lead to life-threatening arrhythmias, torsades de points. They can also be hepatoxic. Therefore, the nurse should monitor liver function tests and an ECG and report significant results to the HCP. Which actions by a registered nurse are reportable to the State Board of Nursing? Select all that apply. 1. Administering hydromorphone without a prescription. 2. Being habitually tardy to work. 3. Documenting an intervention that was not performed. 4. Stealing narcotics. 5. Walking off duty in the middle of a shift. Correct answer. The National Council of State Boards of Nursing advises any individual who has knowledge of a potential violation of a nursing law or rule to file a complaint with the appropriate State Board of Nursing. A nurse should be knowledgeable concerning the presiding board's stance on mandatory reporting and which actions are considered reportable. In general, reportable actions may include any behavior by a licensed nurse that is unsafe, unethical, incompetent, impaired, by substances or a mental or physical condition, or in violation of nursing law. Practicing outside of the scope of the license is reportable even if the practice meets quality standards. Option 1. Documenting an intervention that was not performed is considered falsification of records regarding client care and is a reportable action. Option 3. Stealing narcotics is a criminal offense, a violation punishable by the state that can result in prison or a fine, and is reportable in all states. 
Many states offer an alternate rehabilitation program to nurses who diverted or abused drugs, option 4. Abandonment, like, leaving without proper replacement of personnel and transfer of responsibility for client care, is reportable in all states, option 5. Option 2, work habits are handled under the facility's management policies and are often part of the criteria for discipline and or termination. If the facility has 24-hour care, the offgoing nurse cannot leave without someone assuming responsibility for the clients or waiting for the tardy nurse. Educational Objective Nurse offenses reportable to the State Board of Nursing include criminal acts, such as theft, practicing outside of the scope, falsification of records, and client abandonment. Any individual may file a complaint regarding an action that is potentially unethical, incompetent, impaired, or in violation of nursing law. The nurse is verifying the medical history of a client who is admitted for a scheduled labor induction. Which client statement should prompt the nurse to request further evaluation for a primary cesarean birth from the healthcare provider? 1. A vacuum was used to help deliver my last baby because the baby's heart rate was dropping. 2. I have an atrial septal defect that has never given me any problems. And I plan to receive an epidural during labor. 3. I lost my acyclovir prescription, and I've noticed lesions on my labia that are stinging and burning. 4. I took enoxaparin during this pregnancy due to a history of blood clots, and my last dose was yesterday. Correct answer. Genital herpes, an incurable sexually transmitted infection caused by herpes simplex virus, HS, is characterized by painful, vesicular lesions that form ulcers that crust over. Clients with a history of genital herpes are prescribed antivirals, acyclovir, around 36 weeks gestation to prevent outbreaks prior to labor. Clients with active genital herpes infections, lesions, or prodromal symptoms, like pain, burning, tingling, require a cesarean birth to prevent transmission to the fetus, neonatal HS infection. The nurse should notify the healthcare provider of the client's symptoms and request further evaluation to help facilitate an appropriate plan of care, cesarean birth, option 3. Option 1, often. The use of a vacuum or forces during birth is due to factors that do not influence future births, like abnormal fetal heart rate, maternal exhaustion. Therefore, a history of a vacuum or forceps-assisted birth is not an indication for cesarean birth in subsequent pregnancies. Options 2 and 4, most cardiac diseases, atrial septal defect, and a history of venous thrombus are not indications for cesarean birth. These conditions increase the risk of complications during and following a cesarean birth because of the blood loss and immobility associated with surgery. Educational Objective Clients with an active genital herpes infection or prodromal symptoms require further evaluation for a cesarean birth to prevent infection of the fetus. History of a vacuum-assisted birth An asymptomatic atrial septal defect and venous thrombus are not indications for cesarean birth. The nurse dons personal protective equipment, PPE, before providing care for a client in airborne transmission-based precautions. Place the steps for donning PPE in the appropriate sequence. All options must be used. Hand hygiene, gown, goggles or face shield, gloves, mask or respirator. Correct answer. PPE for the healthcare worker protects the mucous membranes, airways, skin, and clothing from contact with potentially infectious agents. The category of transmission-based precautions, e.g., contact, droplet, airborne, required determines the type of PPE that the healthcare worker will wear. The exact procedure for donning and removing PPE varies with the level of precautions required. Guidelines are provided by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC and by Institution Policy and Procedure.
The sequence for donning PPE includes hand hygiene, gown, fully cover torso from neck to knees, arms to end of wrists, and wrap around back, fasten in back of neck and waist, mask or respirator, secure ties or elastic bands at middle of head and neck, fit flexible band to nose bridge, fit snugly to face and below chin, fit check respirator, goggles or face shield, place over face and eyes and adjust fit, may be combined with mask, visor, gloves, don and extend to cover wrist of isolation gown, educational objective, the CDC suggests the following sequence for donning PPE, hand hygiene, gown, mask or respirator, goggles or face shield, and gloves. The nurse is helping a 10-year-old child hospitalized for vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis to plan activities for the day. What is an appropriate activity to suggest? 1. Doing puzzles in the activity room. 2. Playing an action video game. 3. Reading a new children's book. 4. Walking through the unit hallways. Correct answer. Vasa occlusive sickle cell crisis causes severe pain due to the occlusion of small blood vessels from increased BC sickling. Treatment includes round-the-clock pain management with opioids, IV fluids, bed rest to decrease energy expenditure and oxygen demand, and non-pharmacologic pain-reducing strategies, like guided imagery, warm soaks, positioning. Age-specific activities are important to include in the hospitalized child's plan of care. Activities that effectively distract from pain while maintaining bed rest and promoting growth and development are ideal for children experiencing sickle cell crisis. For a school-aged child, such activities include watching movies and or TV and reading. Option 3. Option 1. A child must be on bed rest when in vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis. Doing puzzles in the activity room does not maintain bed rest and would be too stimulating for the child. Option 2. Age-appropriate video games can effectively distract from pain. However, an exciting action video game can increase oxygen expenditure. In addition, vaso-occlusive ischemic pain often affects the joints, hands, making games that require hand dexterity difficult. Option 4. Walking through the unit hallways can increase physical activity, reduce boredom, and provide stress release but is too physically demanding for a client with vaso-occlusive crisis. In addition, pain would likely discourage the child's participation. Educational Objective Activities that effectively distract from pain, maintain bed rest, and promote growth and development are important in the care of children hospitalized with vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis. For a school-aged child, such activities include watching movies and reading. The nurse observes a client who is postoperative left total knee replacement use a cane. Which action by the client indicates an understanding of the correct technique when walking down the stairs? 1. Descends with the cane on the step first, followed by the left leg, and then the right leg. 2. Descends with the cane on the step first, followed by the right leg, and then the left leg. 3. Descends with the left leg on the step first, followed by the cane, and then the right leg. 4. Descends with the right leg on the step first, followed by the left leg, and then the cane. Correct answer. To prevent falls after a total knee replacement, clients should use a cane to provide maximum support when climbing up and down any stairs. Clients should hold the cane on the stronger side and move the cane before moving the weaker leg, regardless of the direction. Clients must also keep two points of support on the floor at all times, like both feet, foot and cane. When descending stairs, the client should lead with the cane. Bring the weaker leg down next, in this client, it is the left leg. Finally, step down with the stronger leg, option 1. When ascending stairs, the client should step up with the stronger leg first. 
Move the cane next while bearing weight on the stronger leg. Finally, move the weaker leg. To remember the order, use the mnemonic up with the good and down with the bad. The cane always moves before the weaker leg. Options 2, 3, and 4. These options do not provide enough support to the weaker leg when descending. Educational objective. To prevent falls when descending the stairs using a cane. The client should lead with the cane, follow with the weaker leg, and then step down with the stronger leg. The home health nurse visits a client with atrial fibrillation who is newly prescribed digoxin 0.25 mg orally on even-numbered days. Which of the following client statements show that teaching has been effective? Select all that apply. 1. I need to call the healthcare provider, HCP, if I have trouble reading. 2. I need to check my blood pressure before taking my medicine. 3. I should call the HCP if I develop nausea and vomiting. 4. Should check my heart rate prior to taking this medication. 5. I will call the HCP if I feel dizzy and lightheaded. Correct answer. Digoxin, linoxin, is a cardiac glycoside used to treat heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Cardiac glycosides have positive enotropic effects, increased cardiac output, and negative chronotropic effects, decreased heart rate. However, drug toxicity is common due to digoxin having narrow therapeutic range levels, 0.5 to 2.0 nanogram per milliliter. Cardiac arrhythmias are the most dangerous symptoms. Digoxin toxicity can result in bradycardia and heart block, which can cause dizziness or lightheadedness. Option 5. Clients are instructed to check their pulse and if it is low, less than 60 per minute, or has skipped beats to hold the medication and notify the healthcare provider. Option 4. Other manifestations of digoxin toxicity that clients should report include visual symptoms, like alterations in color vision, scotomus, blindness, option 1. Gastrointestinal symptoms, like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, frequently the earliest symptoms, option 3. Neurologic manifestations, like lethargy, fatigue, weakness, confusion. Option 2. There is no need to routinely check blood pressure before taking digoxin as it does not affect blood pressure. Clients should check the pulse prior to administration. Educational objective. Cardiac glycosides, digoxin, have positive enotropic effects, like increased cardiac output, and negative chronotropic effects, like decreased heart rate. Clients are instructed to check their pulse before administration and to report gastrointestinal, like anorexia, nausea, neurologic, and cardiac symptoms and visual changes. The nurse is caring for a 10-year-old client diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The client is at risk for which complication? 1. Delayed physical development. 2. Intrusive thoughts. 3. Low self-esteem. 4. Paranoia. Correct answer. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by inattention, distractibility, and or hyperactivity. Children experiencing hyperactivity are typically restless, have difficulty remaining seated, talk excessively, blurt out answers, and interrupt others. Inattention is characterized by a reduced ability to focus, distractibility, and failure to complete tasks. A diagnosis of ADHD can be made when a child, age less than 17 years, exhibits multiple symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsiveness and or inattentiveness for at least 6 months. Children may struggle to control impulsive behavior and exhibit emotional dysregulation, like low frustration tolerance, irritability, anger outbursts, when unable to meet demands and challenges. Symptoms are typically persistent and can lead to impaired social skills and peer rejection. 
This results in feelings of isolation and low self-esteem. Option 3. Option 1. ADHD is not associated with delayed physical growth unless children taking prescribed stimulant medications do not maintain a proper diet. Option 2. Intrusive thoughts or urges, impulses, or unwanted thoughts associated with obsessive-compulsive disorder, not ADHD. Option 4. Paranoia is associated with schizophrenia and certain personality disorders, like schizotypal personality disorder. Clients with ADHD do not have an increased risk for developing paranoia unless they take high doses of stimulant medications, medication misuse. Educational Objective Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by inattention, distractibility, and or hyperactivity. Symptoms are typically persistent and can lead to impaired social skills and peer rejection, resulting in feelings of isolation and poor self-esteem. A nurse is caring for a client at 30 weeks gestation who is admitted for preterm labor. Which of the following interventions should the nurse anticipate? Select all that apply. 1. Administering IM betamethasone. 2. Administering penicillin via IV piggyback. 3. Assisting with artificial rupture of membranes. 4. Initiating IV magnesium sulfate. 5. Obtaining fetal heart tones once per shift. Correct answer. Preterm labor, PTL, is defined as progressive cervical dilation and or effacement resulting from uterine contractions before term gestation. The nurse should anticipate the following interventions for clients in PTL before 34 weeks gestation. Administering IM antenatal glucocorticoids, like betamethasone. Dexamethasone, to stimulate fetal lung maturation and promote surfactant development, option 1. Administering antibiotics, penicillin, to prevent group B streptococcus infection in the newborn if preterm birth occurs, option 2. Initiating an IV magnesium sulfate infusion for fetal neuroprotection if at less than 32 weeks gestation, option 4. Giving tocolytic medications, like nifedipine, indomethacin, to suppress uterine activity which allows antenatal glucocorticoids time to have a therapeutic effect. Monitoring pertinent laboratory results, including cultures for vaginal or urinary tract infection and group B streptococcus. If obtained, option 3, artificial rupture of membranes, AROM, or amniotomy, is performed to augment labor or assess amniotic fluid in clients who are at term gestation. For clients in PTL, the goal is to prolong pregnancy if possible. Therefore, AROM is contraindicated. Option 5. Clients with suspected PTL should be placed on continuous fetal monitoring to assess for increasing frequency and duration of contractions and to evaluate fetal tolerance of labor. Continuous fetal monitoring is also required if the client is receiving a magnesium sulfate infusion. Educational Objective Preterm labor is progressive cervical dilation and or effacement resulting from uterine contractions before term gestation. The nurse should anticipate several interventions, including administration of IM antenatal glucocorticoids, antibiotics, and IV magnesium sulfate. If you like more videos like this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Here are nursing practice questions from 61 to 70. I hope this helps you in your future NCLEX exam. Which of these clients should the nurse assess first? 1. A client who has shortness of breath from moderate pleural effusion and is waiting for thoracentesis. 2. A client who just had a long leg cast applied and has severe pain despite a dose of morphine. 3. A client with cellulitis who is receiving a first dose of IV antibiotics and has throat tightness. 4. A sickle cell crisis client who has severe bone pain despite a dose of morphine. Correct answer.
First level priorities include issues of airway, breathing, cardiac and circulation, and vital signs, respectively. A client receiving the first dose of an antibiotic is at risk for allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis. Signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis include itching, flushing, hives, wheezing, bronchospasm, swelling of the oral mucosa, and hypotension. This is a potentially fatal complication that requires immediate intervention, option 3. Option 1. This client with a moderate pleural effusion awaiting the corrective procedure would be the last client to be assessed by the nurse. Shortness of breath is an expected symptom of pleural effusion. If signs or symptoms of respiratory distress or hypoxemia occur, this client will increase in priority. Option 2. This client with a new cast experiencing severe pain would be the second client to be assessed. This client is at risk for compartment syndrome and limb loss. Increasing fluid, bleeding, in a confined space or decreasing compartmental capacity, casting, causes neurovascular compromise as the vessels are compressed and unable to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Long bone fractures account for most cases of acute compartment syndrome. Option 4. This client with sickle cell pain would be evaluated third. Although in crisis, the client is not at risk for loss of life or limb. Educational objective. First level priorities include issues of airway, breathing, cardiac and circulation, and vital signs, respectively. Anaphylactic reactions are potentially fatal medical emergencies that must be treated immediately. Compartment syndrome prevents perfusion and can cause tissue death and limb loss. Stable clients awaiting procedures are assessed last. A client with primary hypothyroidism has been taking levothyroxine for a year. Laboratory results today show high levels of TSH. Which statement by the nurse to the client is appropriate? 1. A new prescription will likely be issued for a decreased dose of levothyroxine. 2. Dosages of levothyroxine may need to be increased to improve TSH levels. 3. Levothyroxine should be held. And the TSH levels will be reassessed in 3 months. 4. Start taking your levothyroxine with dietary fiber or calcium to increase its effectiveness. Correct answer. Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, is released from the pituitary gland to stimulate the thyroid to secrete hormones, T3, T4. When sufficient thyroid hormone is circulating, negative feedback causes a normally functioning pituitary to slow or stop the release of TSH. In primary hypothyroidism, the thyroid is unable to synthesize enough T3 or T4, slowing the metabolic rate. In response to low circulating thyroid hormones, the pituitary continues to release TSH, resulting in high TSH levels. Levothyroxine, Synthroid, a thyroid hormone replacement drug, is commonly used to treat hypothyroidism. Levothyroxine dosing is adjusted to regulate circulating thyroid hormone levels. This creates a euthyroid, normal, state and TSH levels are decreased, option 2. Options 1 and 3, decreasing the dose or discontinuing levothyroxine would lead to increased TSH and worsening hypothyroidism as the amount of circulating thyroid hormone decreases. Option 4, levothyroxine should be taken on a consistent morning schedule, at least 30 minutes before a meal. Foods containing certain ingredients, like walnuts, soy products, dietary fiber, calcium, can decrease drug absorption. Educational objective. In primary hypothyroidism, the thyroid does not produce enough hormones, T3, T4. In response to low circulating thyroid hormones, the pituitary continues to release TSH, resulting in high levels of circulating TSH. Levothyroxine is usually started or increased to lead to a euthyroid, normal, state. The nurse is caring for a client who needs an indwelling urinary catheter inserted for urinary retention. 
which tasks would be appropriate to delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel. Select all that apply. 1. Document output from the urinary collection bag. 2. Hold adipose tissue out of the way during catheter insertion. 3. Monitor color of the urine after the nurse has assessed it. 4. Reinforce education about the purpose of the urinary catheter. 5. Secure the catheter to the client's thigh with an anchor. Correct answer. It is within the Unlicensed Assistive Personnel, UAP, scope of practice to document output from a urinary collection bag, option 1. The UAP can assist the nurse during a procedure by helping to position a client or holding part of the client's body, option 2. The UAP may also perform routine tasks, such as securing a catheter to the client's thigh with an anchor device, option 5. Option 3, a licensed practical nurse, LP, may monitor for changes after an initial assessment has been performed by a registered nurse, RN, but this is not within the UAP scope of practice. Option 4, education should be provided by the RN. Reinforcement of education may be performed by the LP, but it is not within the UAP scope of practice. Educational objective, unlicensed assistive personnel, UAP, cannot provide client education, perform assessments, or monitor for assessment changes. UAP should not be delegated tasks outside their scope of practice. While caring for a client in skeletal traction, which tasks can the registered nurse, RN, delegate to experienced unlicensed assistive personnel, UAP, to help prevent immobility hazards? Select all that apply. 1. Assist with active and passive range of motion, ROM exercises. 2. Change bed linens while log rolling the client from side to side. 3. Check the color and temperature of the affected extremity. 4. Remind the client to use the incentive spirometer. 5. Reapply pneumatic compression device after bathing the client. Correct answer. The UAP has the skills and knowledge to perform standard procedures to prevent immobility hazards for a client in traction, like pneumonia pressure ulcers, foot drop, thromboembolism. When providing care for a stable client, the RN can safely delegate these tasks to the UAP. Assist with active and passive ROM exercises after the client has been taught how to perform them by the RN or physical therapist, option 1. Notify the RN of client reports of pain, tingling, or decreased sensation in the affected extremity. Remind the client to use the incentive spirometer after the client has been taught proper use by the RN or respiratory therapist, option 4. Maintain proper use of pneumatic compression devices, option 5. Remind the client to move frequently using the overhead trapeze. Option 2, the UAP changes the linens from the top to the bottom of the bed with assistance. Clients are instructed to lift themselves using the overhead trapeze. This approach maintains immobilization of the injured extremity. Log rolling the client will require multiple staff members, including one person to stabilize weights. Option 3, the RN is responsible for peripheral circulation, neurovascular, and skin assessments. Educational objective, to prevent immobility hazards for a client in skeletal traction. The RN can delegate the following tasks to the UAP. Assist with active and passive ROM exercises. Notify the RN of client reports of pain, tingling, or decreased sensation in the affected extremity. Remind the client to use the incentive spirometer. Maintain proper use of pneumatic compression devices. The nurse administers subcutaneous insulin Lispro at 0730 to a client as prescribed and the client consumes breakfast 30 minutes later. At what time is the client at highest risk for experiencing insulin-related hypoglycemia? 1. 0830 2. 1100 3. 1330 4. 1500
Correct answer. Insulin is produced and excreted by the pancreas into the bloodstream to move glucose into cells. Clients with diabetes mellitus are unable to produce sufficient insulin, type 1, and or are unable to properly use insulin due to insulin resistance of the cells, LA, type 2. Clients are often prescribed combination therapy of long-acting insulin, like Detamir, Glargine, Degladec, to help maintain consistent blood glucose levels and supplemental rapid or short-acting insulin to regulate blood glucose levels with food intake. Peak effect indicates the time when a medication will reach maximum effectiveness. Understanding peak effect for each type of insulin helps to predict when the client will have the lowest blood glucose level and highest risk for insulin-related hypoglycemia. Rapid-acting insulins, Lispro, reach peak effect 1 to 3 hours after subcutaneous administration. A client who received Lispro at 0730 has highest risk for hypoglycemia from 0830-1030, option 1. Option 2, short-acting insulins, regular, reach peak effect 1.5 to 5 hours after administration, peak effect from 0900-1230 if administered at 0730. Options 3 and 4, intermediate-acting insulins, NPH, reach peak effect 4 to 12 hours after administration, peak effect from 1130 to 1930 if administered at 0730. Long-acting insulins can be effective for 24 hours or more, and often do not have a peak effect time. Educational Objective Rapid-acting insulins are often administered to clients with diabetes mellitus to regulate blood glucose levels with food intake. Clients are at the greatest risk for insulin-related hypoglycemia during the time of peak effect, 1 to 3 hours after administration for rapid-acting insulins. The nurse receives report on four clients. Which client should be seen first? 1. Client with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis experiencing increased dysarthria. 2. Client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease reporting increasing leg edema. 3. Client with strep throat and fever of 102F, 38.9C, on antibiotics for 12 hours. 4. Client with urolithiasis reporting wave-like flank pain and nausea. Correct answer. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, is characterized by the progressive loss of motor neurons in the brainstem and spinal cord. Clients have spasticity, muscle weakness, and atrophy. Neurons involved in swallowing and respiratory function are eventually impaired, leading to aspiration, respiratory failure, and death. Care of clients with ALS focuses on maintaining respiratory function, adequate nutrition, and quality of life. There is no cure, and death usually occurs within five years of diagnosis. The client with ALS and worsening ability to speak, dysarthria, may also have dysphagia and respiratory distress. This client should be seen first, option 1. Option 2, the client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and peripheral edema may have core pulmonale, or right-sided heart failure, from vasoconstriction of the pulmonary vessels. Core pulmonale is treated with long-term, low-flow oxygen, bronchodilators, and diuretics. This client should be seen second. Right-sided heart failure, peripheral edema, is not as dangerous as left-sided heart failure, pulmonary edema. Option 3, fever often occurs with strep throat and may persist for 224 hours after initiation of antibiotics. This client should be seen last and should receive an antipyretic. Option 4, wave-like flank pain is characteristic of urolithiasis, urinary stones. This client needs pain medication and, possibly, further treatment, lithotripsy, and should be seen third. Educational Objective Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis causes progressive loss of motor neurons, resulting in muscle weakness and spasticity. Muscles involved in respiration and swallowing are affected, leading to aspiration and, ultimately, respiratory failure. Treatment focuses on maintaining respiratory function, adequate nutrition, and quality of life.
The nurse is teaching an adolescent client about newly prescribed alprazolam and sertraline. Which of the following statements by the client indicate that the teaching was effective? Select all that apply. 1. Should have no more than one alcoholic beverage a day while taking alprazolam. 2. I should not drive after I take alprazolam. 3. I will contact my healthcare provider if I experience suicidal thoughts. 4. I will immediately stop taking alprazolam if I feel dizzy or lightheaded. 5. I will take sertraline at the onset of a panic attack. Correct answer. Panic disorder is often treated with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, sertraline, or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, venlafaxine, for long-term maintenance. Anxiety may initially worsen because clients with panic disorder are sensitive to these medications. Benzodiazepines are frequently co-prescribed for the first few weeks because they work faster and are more efficacious. Benzodiazepines, lorazepam, alprazolam, are central nervous system, CNS, depressants that potentiate the effect of gamma-aminobutyric acid, GABA, a powerful inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. GABA decreases excitability of neurons to produce a sedative effect. Clients taking alprazolam and sertraline should avoid driving while taking benzodiazepines due to the sedative effect, drowsiness. Option 2. Immediately report suicidal thoughts to the healthcare provider because SSRIs can increase the risk for suicide in children and young adults during initial treatment. Option 3. Option 1. Taking benzodiazepines with other CNS depressants, alcohol, opioids, can produce significant respiratory depression and death. Option 4. Benzodiazepines should not be abruptly discontinued, which can precipitate dangerous withdrawal symptoms, seizures. The health care provider should be notified if the client is unable to tolerate adverse effects, dizziness, lightheadedness. Option 5. SSRIs should be taken consistently at scheduled times to prevent future panic attacks. SSRIs do not treat acute symptoms. Educational Objective. Clients taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRLs, should immediately report suicidal thoughts and take SSRIs consistently at scheduled times. Clients taking benzodiazepines should avoid concurrent use of other central nervous system depressants, driving while taking benzodiazepines, and abrupt discontinuation of benzodiazepines. A laboring client at 35 weeks gestation comes to the labor and delivery unit with preterm rupture of membranes about 18 hours ago. The client's group B streptococcus status is unknown. What intervention is a priority for this client? 1. Administration of prophylactic antibiotics. 2. Assessment of uterine contraction frequency. 3. Collection of a clean catch urine specimen. 4. Vaginal examination to assess cervical dilation. Correct answer. Group B streptococcus, GBS, may be present as part of normal vaginal flora in up to 30% of pregnant clients. Although colonization with GBS rarely poses harm to the client, it can be transmitted to the newborn during labor and birth, resulting in serious complications, like neonatal GBS sepsis, pneumonia. Pregnant clients are tested for GBS colonization at 35 to 37 weeks gestation and receive prophylactic antibiotics during labor if results are positive. If GBS status is unknown, antibiotics are typically indicated when membranes have been ruptured for greater than 18 hours, maternal temperature is greater than 100.4 F, 38 C, or gestation is less than 37 weeks, option 1. Option 2. Part of the client's assessment includes evaluation of the uterine contraction pattern. However, the client and newborn are at risk for infection due to prolonged rupture of membranes and unknown GBS status, so antibiotic administration is the priority. 
Option 3. A urine specimen is often collected to evaluate for proteinuria in clients with elevated blood pressure or to assess for urinary tract infection in symptomatic clients. Urine specimen collection is not the priority for this client. Option 4. Vaginal examinations should be limited in the presence of ruptured membranes. Multiple vaginal examinations in such a client correlate with an increased risk for infection, chorioamnionitis. Educational Objective Group B Streptococcus, GBS, infection can be transmitted to the newborn during labor and birth and cause serious complications. Indications for prophylactic antibiotics during labor include maternal GBS positive status or unknown GBS status with fever is greater than or equal to 100.4 F, 38 C, preterm gestation, and or prolonged rupture of membranes. The nurse plans teaching for a client who was newly prescribed levothyroxine sodium after thyroid removal. Which instructions will the nurse include in the teaching plan? Select all that apply. 1. Drowsiness is a common side effect. Taking the dose at bedtime will make this less noticeable. 2. Notify the healthcare provider if you become pregnant as the medication is harmful to the fetus. 3. Notify the healthcare provider if you feel a fluttering or rapid heartbeat. 4. Take the medication with a meal to prevent stomach upset. 5. You will need to take this medication for the rest of your life. Correct answer. Levothyroxine sodium, like levoxyl, levothroid. Synthroid, is used to replace thyroid hormone in clients with hypothyroidism, inadequate thyroid hormone, and for those who have had their thyroid removed. These clients must understand that this medication must be taken for the rest of their lives, option 5. A client's dose is adjusted based on serum TSH levels to prevent too much or too little hormone. Clients must be taught to report signs of excess thyroid hormone such as heart palpitations, tachycardia, weight loss, and insomnia, option 3. Option 1. Clients with hypothyroidism experience lethargy and somnolence. Hormone replacement therapy will increase metabolic activity and alertness. Option 2. This medication is a hormone that is normally present in the body, so it is safe to take during pregnancy. The dose may need to be altered due to the metabolic demands of pregnancy. But the drug will not harm the fetus. Option 4. It is best to take this medication first thing in the morning as it is best absorbed on an empty stomach, one hour before or two hours after a meal. Educational Objective Clients receiving thyroid hormone replacement therapy, levothyroxine sodium, should understand that treatment is lifelong and be taught the signs of excess hormone, like tachycardia, palpitations, weight loss, insomnia. The medication is best absorbed on an empty stomach and is safe to take during pregnancy. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Next will be videos 71 to 80.